Uh, honorable members, just a reminder in terms of uh, our rules that uh, we, we must at all times uh, keep our mics uh, muted. This also applies to uh, all the other participants on the platform, we keep our mics uh, muted and the video camera switched off until you are recognized by the chairperson. Uh, who will then uh, uh, indicate that you are recognized and that you can proceed to unmute your mic as well as your video camera. In a situation where you're experiencing network challenges, uh, you may advise that you would want to switch your video camera off so as to maximize the bandwidth. Honorable members, uh, in cases of place uh, of points of order, uh, please ensure that that you do uh, respecting the rules. One being that uh, you remain muted until you are recognized by the chair. Only at that time that you'd unmute your mic and raise the point of order you're going to raise. As a guide, we also advise not to raise unnecessary point of orders on the platform to a point of collapsing uh, the meeting. Uh, of course, there will be times when uh, people may connect or reconnect after losing a connection. Please ensure at all times as you reconnect to the meeting that your mic and your mic is muted and your video camera is off so as not to distract the speaker that may be on the platform at the time as mics uh, are sensitive and could pick up uh, background sounds which may interfere with the meeting. So if we keep that, uh, we would uh, be able to have a meeting that proceeds smoothly and be able to achieve uh, the objective set for the meeting. So that is really to just deal with the formalities. Uh, but just for purposes of confirming that we are a correcting meeting that's able to proceed with the business of the meeting, may I just check if there are apologies received uh, from the committee support staff so that we place those on the record. Morning, Chairperson. We have apology from Ms. Mpembu, member of our committee. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Mtembo would have apologized, and I take it that uh, that apology is accepted. May I check if there are apologies that members may have sent, which the committee may have not taken care of in that regard? If there are no, uh, there's been confirmation that we have the required numbers to proceed with the meeting and would note the apology received from Honorable uh, Timbo. I will then, without a waste of time, Honorable Members, just as a way of opening officially this uh, meeting of the committee, probably the last one uh, in this term, uh, before Parliament uh, rises and, and uh, members get to constituency work as I have said previously, our oversight visit would have been affected by the change in the parliamentary program uh, with two motions that are coming before parliament, which uh, needs all of us to be in parliament. Uh, would uh, still pursue uh, the point of getting this committee to do oversight. Otherwise, almost all that we put forward in the required times have been affected by changes in the parliamentary program and therefore they've been declined. So we'll continue uh, along those lines. Uh, may I also say that uh, honorable members, as we meet today, it's also uh, two days before the uh, analog switch off uh, timelines that were presented in Akrita Poor. And, and therefore would have needed an update. <clears throat> and whilst we have asked for that update uh, last week, we, we would have received a response which we said we'll still need to uh, get back to that point. 
We're also meeting, of course, at a time when there are uh, other developments in that regard and uh, in the update that the minister would, have, would give to us, uh, would also be taken into confidence on and the developments uh, in, in that regard, uh, as, as they would have happened between the last week's meeting and today's meeting. So, so we'd have asked the minister to come before the committee to, to brief the committee and, and update us as such. And we'll then have an opportunity to engage with the minister in that regard. As you would see in the notice, we would start with that one so that after engaging with the minister, we'll be able to release uh, the minister to attend to other matters. Uh, we would uh, try and see, depending on uh, how long it takes us in that engagement, uh, but we would have uh, planned that by half past 10, we would uh, deal with uh, the seminar part of uh, the Vets Link Center, which we spoke about, uh, which was in the program for an earlier date. Uh, but if uh, at that time, we would still have time between uh, the conclusion of discussions with the minister and her first 10, if we are able to, we'll just get uh, the adoption of the reports as well as the minutes uh, out of the way so that the one hour for a uh, seminar with uh, by the Vets Link Center, we can, uh, after that close and, and get to, to other meetings that members may have to attend to. So that's gonna be the approach would, would start with the minister to give us uh, uh, the update on the PDM, uh, in particular the analog uh, switch off uh, timelines and so on and developments around that and how to move uh, from here. Um, once again, please feel welcomed, uh, including yourself, Minister, and thanks for uh, responding uh, that you, you are able to be with us this morning. And I take it that at this point, uh, the Minister would be ready uh, and, and therefore would invite her to uh, take uh, podium. Minister, you are recognized, you can proceed. Thank you, Chairperson. Good morning to yourself and to the members of the Portfolio Committee. Chairperson, indeed, 24 hours, it's a long time in any place that there is work. But I'll, I'll want to start not on the BDM out, update, but this is part of the BDM update. I'd like to start on the events that happened subsequent to my decision to, uh, to determine the 31st of March as the analog switch off date. On the 7th of March, I received a correspondence from the SABC board that alleged a revenue loss, advertising revenue loss due to a loss of viewers. Because we had a, a case that was going to be heard on the 14th and 15th, and I suspected that, that uh, the correspondence between me and the SABC may leak, I decided that I will respond, but opted to respond after the case was heard. Indeed, the letter that the SABC sent to me on the 7th of March was never leaked because it came to me. But my response on the 24th of March was leaked to the media. Equally, my response uh, to the SABC after they issued a statement a was leaked uh, to the media. And I just wanted to give you the, the context under which we were operating at that time. And on the letter, when, when the SABC made allegations, I responded and clarified the SABC on a letter dated the 24th of March, which I have subsequently submitted to parliament because I have indicated to the SABC that I will submit to parliament a request to withdraw quarter one, quarter two, quarter three of the 2021-22 financial year that is ending now until they determine which sets of facts is accurate. On that letter of the 24th, I had indicated that the quarterly and monthly reports that the SABC sent, both performance and financial, that they sent to the Department and National Treasury. And therefore, I subsequently sent to Parliament as the executive authority, are providing information that is contradictory 
to the information they've provided on the letter of the, 24, uh, of the 7th of March. This was my response on the letter of the 27th of March. I articulated the discrepancies and uh, the SABC opted not to respond to me, but then issue a media statement, which media statement I found unwarranted and unacceptable because what they did, they now placed on public records information that contradict the information that I had submitted on behalf of the executive, uh, of the accounting authority of the SABC to the uh, parliament, as I'm required to do so by section 65, one of the Public Finance Management Act. I therefore wrote to the SABC and said, SABC, you cannot have your cake and eat it. The information that is in the quarterly reports and the information that is in your media statement, which was based on the letter of the 7th of March, they are contradictory to each other, and but they cannot be mutually ex exclusive. I informed them and I gave them time to say, if they, they do not determine which public record is accurate, I am going to withdraw the uh, quarterly reports from parliament because I cannot be party to misleading parliament. Because the law enjoins me that if I if discover that information submitted to parliament was not accurate, I must immediately inform parliament of such. I then said, requested the SABC to determine which set of facts is correct, the one they've placed on public record or the one they've placed on public through the parliamentary process. Because the PFMA section 51C enjoins the board of the SABC who are the accounting authority that on request, they must disclose to the executive authority responsible for that entity, all material facts, including those reasonably discoverable which in any way may influence decisions or actions of the executive authority or, the, or that legislature. The basis of that is that uh, when I said to them they must determine is because we are also funding the SABC's turnaround, but that funding is conditional on the SABC showing improvements in performance. So when the SABC writes to me and also puts it on public records in the media statement and say that there has been revenue loss on uh, advertising, there's venue law because of a switch off. Whereas the facts point differently, we must then determine that therefore there, there is, or we may be at fault of misleading parliament. So I wrote to the speaker to say to the speaker, I have submitted the quarter one, quarter two, quarter three performance report of the S and financial reports of the SABC to parliament. But I have learned since through other correspondence that uh, with the accounting officer that the performance and financial information contained in these reports may not be accurate due to discrepancies in the amounts reported under revenue information. In summary, the SABC addressed a letter to me on the 7th of March, 2022, wherein it alleged that it experienced viewership loss as a result, it lost, it had experienced losses in advertising revenue because of the provincial switch-offs. The allegation, however, does not correspond with the financial information submitted for quarter one, quarter two, and quarter three. In terms of the financials, the SABC re reported a loss in advertising revenue in, for quarter one and quarter two. That was before the switch off commenced. In addition, the SABC reported an increase in advertising revenue for quarter three, the period in which the switch off commenced. And I've attached the supporting letters. <coughs> Furthermore, <coughs> The SABC alleged that millions of people will be deprived of public television services as a result of premature switch off. The millions that the SABC refers to cannot be further from the truth. This is so because the total registered qualifying households, including those registered after the 31st of October 2021 to date, that government is aware of amounts to less than 1.5 million. And government stands by its commitment to provide set of boxes to all registered qualifying households, and to this end, registrations remain open. Consequently, I've requested the SABC board and accounting who are the accounting authority to determine the set of facts or information that is accurate between that is, which is contained in their letter to me and the subsequent media statement, and uh, which I've uh, uh, attached for parliament, and also the information that is contained in the quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarterly reports of 2021, 2022 financially. 
And until such time that the accounting authority has determined and confirmed which record is accurate between that which is submitted in the quarterly reports of 21-22 financial year and the information contained in their letters and the media statement, I provisionally withdraw the 2021-22 quarters one, two, three performance and financial report. And because part of the information they claim included quarter four of the 2020-21 financial year, which will include the, the annual report of, quarter, of year 2020-21, which was also considered by parliament. I opted to take internal legal advice on the extent of the inconsistent of inconsistence of information as it relates to that, and um, because the uh, annual report is already adopted. But equal, because that information is contained in the information around the turnaround and that supports the continued turn, uh, funding of the SABC turnaround, I informed the SABC that I'm going to notify the Minister of Finance to withhold, that of my intention to withhold funding to the SABC turnaround. The SABC has since requested a meeting with me, which will meet uh, within before the end of this week. So because of that, I've withhold, withheld uh, writing or notifying the Minister of Finance of my intention to withhold the turnaround funds. But I'd want the SABC to determine which sets of records is accurate because they cannot have two sets of records that contradict each other that are accurate. And if the records that are in the quarterly reports are accurate, I'll equally inform parliament the, the, for my reinstatement of those reports that some of them already been uh, considered by this portfolio committee. If the records uh, that they are accurate are those contained in their letter and their media statement, I will then inform parliament to for my withdrawal of those quarter reports. That will have an impact on the ability of the SABC to submit its annual financial statements because they will have to redo the, the records completely. So I needed to bring that to your attention because of the leaks that had taken place, but also because I've formally written to parliament and the portfolio committee will be uh, charged with uh, considering those matters when the board of the SABC has determined which information is accurate. And uh, honorable chairperson, it was important for me to take that step because there is a tendency to be to, to adopt bipolar or schizophrenic uh, approaches in government officials and those in the boards of uh, public entities to choose what they agree with and what they don't agree when it's convenient and when it's not based on facts. For we must start to call out people to account for the information they hold and the consistency of maintaining that information as accurate and relying on one set of facts because. The judgment has agreed with me. And Chairperson, that's why I said today, it's a, we are dealing with what we call, what is the, for a lack of a better word, a continuously improving situation. Yes, we were in court with the ETV. It's supported by CASA and Vodacom around the matter of whether I can determine this, uh, the cut off date of uh, analog switch off and they were arguing that I did not consult and I should have consulted with on, on determining that date and that millions of people are going to be uh, excluded or, or to, uh, from watching television. We had argued or, or to say that uh, there is a policy that has been consulted by government. There are regulations that were consulted by government and these consultations commenced as early as 2006. ETV has been party to the consultations. And in terms of policy, the minister is only required to consult with, with cabinet to determine the analog set of date. And the minister is only required to determine the cut off date uh, of uh, dual elimination and the analog switch off based on conditions that are set on ICASA uh, the resolutions that says there must be a coverage of DTT network across the country. And we had determined that there is coverage of DTT uh, network across the country that meets the requirements set by ICASA in terms of their regulations. And we had determined that in terms of a caring government that took a decision that they will connect or assist the poor and the, the operating word is assist. They will assist the poor who register on and meet a certain criteria. 
they then they will then have the obligation that when that uh, assistance is given, then the analog switch off can be done. There is no policy of government that requires the minister to connect people to set top boxes. The cabinet as a part of a caring government took a decision that says there are poor households that may be as that may warrant being assisted to connect to set top boxes for them to be able to watch television. And secondly, that those households must register before they are entitled to that assistance. To date, 1.5 million households have registered. Before then, we communicated a cabinet decision to extend the registration date and cut off for, for assistance to say, those who register by the 31st of October, 2021, will then be connected before the analog switch of date is done. It is for that reason, Chairperson, when you were trying to look for me the whole of last week and the week before, when, we, uh, uh, when you were wanting me to come and brief the portfolio committee, you could not reach me directly because I was out in the provinces to make sure that our people who had, who had applied on time are indeed connected. We had on the 14th of uh, March during the arguments and uh, which the court recorded as the 15th of March, submitted a report on the connections that still had to be done before the 30, on or before the 31st of March. At that point, we needed to still do uh, 507,000 uh, households to connect because uh, we, our commitment for the cutoff date was to connect the 1.2 million South Africans. To date, as I talk to you, we have connected over 900 and, and distributed over 900,000 set-top boxes to households in South Africa. We are, we are having outstanding 325,000 uh, set-top boxes to be distributed and connected to households in South, in South Africa. So Chairperson, when we were doing that, because ICASA had to give effect to the uh, analog switch update. ICASA yesterday morning, uh, morning announced that they were going to give effect of the uh, 31st of March analog set of date, uh, cut off, uh, switch off and switch on date by one, providing for a transitional period for the broadcasting services and the signal distributors to exit or uh, vacate the 800 and 700 bands and all the analog bands by 30, uh, 30th of June, 2022. This date uh, uh, will allow the new spectrum that was licensed to be taken over by the, those who participated in the uh, auction, the, which are the telcos and the, uh, tel the telecommunications mobile network operators by the 1st of July, 2022, which is the effective date of the new licenses taking effect. So ICASA, we accept accepted the decision of ICASA to, uh, to, for the transitional period because to allow a seamless uh, transition so that there is no disruption. In the evening last night, we had then received communication from the judge and the judgment was issued. We re I received it at quarter to eight in the evening when I was briefing cabinet on the matter or when I was just about to brief cabinet on the matter and our, read our readiness for this that the judgment is out. And I want to indicate in terms of the judgment and I want to, the members to, to bear with me uh, in terms of give me some indulgence. That one, the court has deferred my, dis, uh, my date or which I have determined as the 31st of March, 2022 as the analog switch off date and the switch on date and the end of dual elimination to the 30th of June, 2022 as the analog uh, date. The court in its uh, judgment, they, it explained that it deferred that to allow government to ensure that those who applied on time by the 31st of October, which uh, by the, during the court discussion, by the 10th of March where 507,000 households must be connected before that switch off does in line with God, what government had committed. And we accept that and we appreciate that court has given us a breathing time we were not sleeping for the last uh, two weeks to make sure that we meet that target. At least now, even though we'll maintain the pace and the pressure, we are going to um, uh, we are going to have some time to rest in between, so that we because we are human and not robots. 
And we also note that that date that the court has chosen coincides with the date that the spectrum uh, was going to be vacated by the broadcasters and the signal distributors. And therefore, we appreciate that the decision of the court does not defer the coming into effect of the licenses of the spectrum that was auctioned to the public uh, by ICASA because they come into effect on the 1st of July, 2022. But also what I want to appreciate is that the cost has found ETV to be truant and slapped them with costs, with a cost order. ETV is paying 50% of the cost of the Minister of Communication and Digital Technologies and also paying 100% of the cost of ICASA, the chairperson of ICASA and Vodacom who were party to the case. That is the best signal that the court can ever say send to ETV to indicate that you are wrong and your behavior is not acceptable. We are hoping that ETV will then, because they are known in Jefferson and other honorable members for derailing the analog uh, uh, pro, uh, switch off process. They've derailed this matter previously up to the constitutional court and they even lost then to say, you cannot determine that which government has determined. Government has the obligation to meet inter international commitments. And we are happy that the court reaffirmed that. Furthermore, I'm happy that this judgment has done the following. One, it has confirmed that the rights are reciprocal and for every right, there is an obligation. This is the view that I've publicly expressed that, that government has a responsibility to assist households that register and fulfill the requirements for government assistance. In this regard, I'm urging all South Africans and I'm hoping the portfolio committee will join me in urging all South Africans who earn less than 3,500 per month to register for assistance at their nearest post office or online through www.stbregistrations.gov.za because registration for support has not closed and it continues. Two, the government, the court has affirmed the government's responsibility to assist households still watching TV analog trans, uh, through analog transmitters is limited to those households that meet the government set criteria and register for such assistance. In addition, government had clearly articulated this criteria for those who qualify for government support. Also, the court has affirmed that it will be unreasonable to allow a situation where an unknown variable, that is the unregistered households, is allowed to hold up a process that will eventually be of benefit to all citizens and where government must meet its international obligations. And to avoid the missing middle household, I'm calling on the free, a safe free to air TV coalition to redirect its energies towards mobilizing the qualifying households to register for government assistance. And also the court has affirmed that government has done enough within its powers to help the qualifying households to realize their right to freedom of expression, including freedom to receive information. And the court has also acknowledged that it is near impossible for government to establish who else qualifies for a set of box without the affected households registering. <coughs> Excuse me. As not all indigent households own an analog TV, and not all households that are that own an analog TV are indigent. And also that the ETV's disagreement with the process followed and preference for a process that serves its commercial interest does not require further consultation opportunities. ETV cannot dispute its inclusion in several satisfactory consultations over many years regarding the process of digital migration. And also the court has reaffirmed that the formulation of policy is an executive competency and the duty to consult will only arise in circumstances where it will be irrational to take a decision without further input from industry. And also the court has affirmed that there is nothing that prevents the minister from determining and announcing the switch of date as 31 March 2022. As I've indicated earlier, the sole reason the court deferred the date to 30 June was to allow me to complete the, con uh, the connection of those households that had applied by the 31st of October, 2021. It is in the interest of the country and the economy and South Africans in general that digital migration be finalized. And we remain committed to ensure that the 507, 251 households that registered by the 31st of October, 2021 are connected by no later than 30 June, 2022, which is a date the court had deferred analog switch off to. 
In addition, the department will ensure that the 216, 868 households that registered between the 31st of October 2021 and the 10th of March 2022 are connected to their set-top boxes by later than the 30th of September 2022, as ordered by the court. And Chairperson, this remains our commitment. And those who, con who apply later, we will then connect them as and when they come through. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, uh, Honorable Minister. Honorable members, that's uh, the update from the Minister. Uh, starting with the quarterly reports as it relates to SABC, uh, as well as uh, the update which includes uh, the judgment as far as the switch of date uh, for analog. I will now take uh, those that want to contribute, ask questions of clarity, or make comments on what the minister would have shared with us. Ajira will also assist me with hands if I do not uh, get to see Amy at this point. I'll do that, Chief. Honorable members, may I invite you to make your comments? Um, I see Honorable uh, Dr. Basobsen is up. Uh, you are recognized, you can proceed and Ajira will assist me in identifying other hands that may have come up. Mr. Malatsi, Chairperson, Mr. Malatsi. Honorable Malatsi, Honorable uh, Bolani, I see. We will proceed in that in that order and then I'll identify. Ms. Kubeka, Chair, Ms. Kubeka. Honorable Kubeka would be after uh, Honorable Bolani. So we'll take Honorable Dr. Basop, you can proceed, followed by Honorable Malati, Honorable Botani, and Honorable. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair, uh, Honorable Members, Honorable Minister, as well as the officials that are part of the meeting. Good morning, everybody. Uh, in appreciating the report, uh, Chairperson, I mean, the update. Let's thank the, 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 the minister for the update, though it's, 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 it's giving us a bad picture in terms of the update as, as far as the issue of SABC board is concerned. <clears throat> then I've got only three questions that I want to raise, Chair. <clears throat> Chairperson and honorable members, firstly, I just want to check from us um, is what are the implications of, 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 of the withdrawal of the report. Um, the report that was scrutinized and we interacted and as well as we adopted as a committee on behalf of that house. And, and, and all of a sudden now, because of the reasons that have been put forward by the minister, honorable minister, what are the implications of that in terms of our rules? That's one question. Number two, Obviously, Chairperson, as an oversight body, we are expected to take a decision about this. Uh, then what I just want to check, whether are we, are, we, are we in a position to have an access to the correspondences between the minister and, 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 and the board? I, I'm raising this, Chair, because uh, uh, at the end of the day, we are expected as a committee to take an informed decision. And for us to do that, uh, uh, we must have enough information in front of us, uh, 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 Chairperson. Then the, 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 the third one is about the, the, the leakage of the information. Uh, perhaps what, the, for me, this is not the right thing, first and foremost, to leak an information, it's wrong. But I just want to check what, what action has been taken by the office of the, of the minister to address that. And again, my interest chair is, is, is the is SAP, SAPC board part of this meeting. Because really chair, for me, uh, 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 the, the picture that is given to us is not the right one. And, 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 and at the end of the day, we are expected to take a decision, I mean, to address 
the, this problem that is put forward uh, uh, to us as a committee. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Pasok. The Honorable Malachi, you can proceed. Um, thanks, Chair, and thanks to that detailed brief from, from the Minister. Look, I think for, for just appropriate handling of the matter with regards to the SABC, um, Chair, I think for the committee's side, um, we need to have engagement with the SABC um, in order to, to, as Honorable Basoku said, us to be able to take the informed decision by also being fair to the process by, by you know, hearing the other side. Because it is very conspicuous from um, the minister's presentations and you know, her side that there are very unhealthy tensions between the SABC and the minister. And it's playing itself out in this way where it is even affecting the process of parliamentary accountability. Um, more so as evidenced by you know the the, the alert that the minister has sent uh, has sent to the speaker with regards to the withdrawals of those report. Um, secondly, with regards to the status update regarding the the dates on the analog switch off and switch on, I think you know the the deferring the date, the cost deferred um, of the date is is a responsible thing to do in here because you know there's still also concerns that I'm sure as members of the committee we have also in the past week or so been inundated with contacts from different um, stakeholders with regards to concerns about you know um, the population that might be left out but I think minister there's also an opportunity in this regard to accelerate the awareness with regard to the public's um, registration because it is very clear that it, it didn't reach as broadly as it should have um, reached uh, and that it should be an inclusive process that tries to bring together everyone as much as possible, no matter how cumbersome that process is. And you're absolutely right that, you know, if there are individuals that have registered, they shouldn't be held back uh, by an unverified number of, you know, individuals who haven't registered or who we presume haven't registered. But I think in light of the volume of, of concerns to the process and ensuring that you pull everyone together towards um, this migration, it is then incumbent and very important that we embark on a far more aggressive awareness um, campaign in making sure that one, the date, um, the new date now of the 30 um, June or is it July if you indicated is, is, is broadly known so that we can accelerate that process so that this major development does not become exclusionary and it doesn't become a case of, you know, or leaving behind other people when there are measures that can be used to make sure that we pull um, we pull them forward to, towards this new dispensation. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Malachi. Honorable Pajlani. Thank you so much, Chairperson, and good morning to everybody, and good morning to the Minister. And indeed, thank you, Minister, for a very comprehensive report. Uh, I've got a few points, but let me start off from what I noticed from the Minister's response address is that there was no policy that was developed for digital migration. I'm not sure if the minister is able to elaborate considering that it really took us over 15 years to get to this point. Why was there a neglect in terms of policy formulation? And perhaps if we had that sort of policy, it would have guided the process better. We would not have taken this law this long, I beg your pardon. Uh, minister, as Honorable Malazi has said, there, there are consent organizations which tells us that civil society is alive and well in South Africa and it's a very important aspect of our democratic dispensation. One of the issues that the civil society is raising is the issue of the application on the WhatsApp not being responsive as you open up applications if I understood you correctly and also the application process not being zero rated. Those are the things that I, I would love for you to please speak to. And we have the post office as a very key stakeholder in the application process. And as the members of this committee, we are exposed to the challenges that the post office faces. I'm not sure what intervention can the minister make 
to make sure that while the applications do proceed in, in, in the face of the challenges of the post office, that the poor, the unemployed, the youth, the old are not excluded from the, 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 the process of application. Because if you listen to all the messages that you are, we are receiving as parliamentarians for, from civil society, their biggest issue was the issue of the timeline, which now the court has made a pronunciation on to the 30th of June. And that begs the question, Minister, to say, in your previous address to the portfolio, you had said that you were going to need an extra six months to cover those that were outside the application process. I know you, you made a point about it in your la as, as your last sentence. I missed that. So I beg your indulgence in, in milk, helping me understand that, that the new date of the court as much as we also welcome the date to say it will make sure that people are not excluded. What does it mean in terms of the people who had not applied that you were going to cover with the additional six months? I do appreciate that you made that point, but I did miss it. So thank you, Chairperson, and thank you, Minister. The Honorable Kubeka, you are recognized. Uh, thanks, Chairperson, and greetings to the officials, members who are present today, and also to you, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson, firstly, let me also uh, thank uh, the minister by the briefing that she has given us today. Uh, it's a, a full detailed information that she has given us today. Uh, so I would like to say to, 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 to the minister, is it possible maybe as she's asking to say, even the side of the portfolio committee maybe can uh, try to assist on the side of those people who are not uh, uh, registered at this present moment, maybe also on their side uh, to have a, a, a slot or to just to keep on advertising on those uh, 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 households that are not uh, being registered at this present moment, just to push the number up. But really, I would like just to thank, to say indeed, on the side of the SABC, as also uh, Honorable Malazi is raising to say, it will be good also if we can uh, invite to the portfolio committee the side of the SABC in order that we can get also their side. But uh, on the side of the minister, it's very clear as you have presented to say your commitment as you were trying and pushing uh, to, 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 to manage to be on time. And also you have already sensitized us with that a, a month of June uh, to say you want just to cover, not to leave anyone uh, outside uh, the scope to those who have applied. Uh, I, I think it's key and indeed uh, as uh, the court also have managed to push and to prove on the side of the ETV to say you were on the right track, uh, Minister. I would like also to appreciate on that side. But let's try to have the side also of the SAPC. But I think uh, as, 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 as the portfolio committee, as we can listen to your side, uh, I, I don't see uh, where you are having a, 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 a snap actually on the issue as you were preparing yourself. But indeed, we want just to be sensitized uh, uh, the side of the SABC, especially on those reports that uh, they have already tabled and it's contradicting with the, 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 the are also statement on the side of the letter. I think we are taking it into consideration we will want you to hear, and indeed you have done a good job in order that we can just sensitize them to say, no, uh -uh, you are still awake, you are just uh, listening and following their reports and also on the side of the, of, the, of the letter that they have written. And it's not an easy thing, but I do understand the issue of SABC on the side of leaking information, that thing is very bad and they are keep on doing the SAPC. I don't know because you have asked also the meeting just to sit with them down in order to engage one another. But they are preferring also instead of sitting down to go and leak the information of which this is the bad picture 
but we would like to know and understand it because at the end of the day, we would like to take a decision on those reports. If those reports are not the correct ones, we need to do justice. We can't just uh, uh, keep quiet and say uh, they have just uh, contradicting themselves. So it is going to be good, uh, Chair, if we can have a meeting with the SAPC in, in order that we can hear. It's not for the first time, actually, the SAPC to do this. Uh, we would like uh, to, 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 to have a justice on those reports. I thank you, uh, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable uh, Kubeka. May I just check, Ajira, if there are other hands from members before I give to the minister? Yeah, yes, yes, Chairperson. May I say something? Yes, is that Honorable Madisha? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Tove Lamre. Please proceed. Um, I, I, I want to uh, agree with the other members uh, that in so far as the uh, policy is concerned, um, that which they are raising has got to be looked into. I must say that one is quite happy uh, with the court processes, and that indeed calls on us to sit down and uh, do more. And uh, secondly, on this thing of the SABC, um, I'm happy that the other members have raised this uh, because what one wanted to raise is actually even much more deeper. Um, but uh, if you say we shall discuss this in the next meeting, um, I will embrace that because the information that uh, some of us have uh, is extreme, it's extreme, it shows lots and lots of uh, uh, corruption, lots and lots of things which, um, are terrible to this country, and therefore a lot has got to be done. I therefore want to um, agree with the other members who say that let's put this uh, so that we then can be able to look into uh, it uh, uh, properly in the next meeting. But it is a horrendous kind of thing that is there. And SABC belongs to the people of South Africa. We've got to do something. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, uh, Honorable Matisha. Um, as I said, if there's any other member who would want to speak that I've not been able to identify, uh, please uh, indicate. I would have left Honorable uh, Matisha easily um, because of the name of the gadget. Uh, I didn't know this other name, Mini, uh, Honorable Matisha. <laughs> no, I'm going to advanced. I'm far much advanced than the chairperson. So that is why, you see. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Patricia. Yes, is that Honorable Mlala? Yes, yes, it's me, but I'm on, on transit, so I'm unable to open my camera. Am I allowed, Chair? Yes, as I as I indicated, Honorable Mla, you can then proceed. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, let me first uh, thank the Minister for the presentation. And uh, I think, just to be precise, Chair, what the Minister has presented uh, is not anything new to the committee. Maybe some of us who have been with SABC for some time, uh, we know, uh, Chair, I'm disturbed by the sound. Can, can I reserve my comment? Because uh, I'm just next to the flight, so it's making a lot of noise. Thank you, Honorable Mlala. Uh, honorable members, I will now give to the minister uh, to respond to whatever points you would want to respond to. And we try and get a summary that also captures our way forward uh, as the committee on the matters raised. The Honorable Minister. Thank you, Chairperson, and thank you to the members for the questions. I need to indicate I've done what I call, what is called a provisional withdrawal. So it means it's not a withdrawal, it's provisional. 
And that provisional withdrawal is done on the basis that the information they provided in their letter of the 7th of March contradicts the information in their quarter report. As required by law, I've given, and I've quoted the section of the PFMA, section 50, subsection one. I've given the SABC an opportunity to which information is accurate, whether it's the information that's in the, in the quarterly reports or the information that is the, in their letter of the 7th of March. So that, because they cannot have the two sets of information together. So when they've given me feedback and they requested a meeting, I must indicate it's them who requested a meeting and I've accept, uh, accept, um, accepted their meeting request. When they've clarified which information is correct, it will then lead to the full with the complete withdrawal or the reinstatement of the report. That's the two things. So there is, in, 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 there is no point of the portfolio committee to call the SABC on this matter before they determine which information is accurate to me as their accounting, as their executive authority. But in terms of the law, as a member of this parliament and also as a minister of cabinet, I'm required by law that when I become aware of any inconsistency, I must alert parliament. And so that the act of alerting parliament is the one that I've explained to yourself to say, I've alerted the speaker, which in turn, because the speaker will direct the letter to yourself. I'm now of alerting you as the letters to the speaker, as the letter to the speaker is going to be directed to the portfolio. I'm alerting you that there is this inconsistency, but the SABC is still to determine which set of information is correct. That it solely depends on them. And I'll inform the speaker and therefore the portfolio committee when they've determined to say which information is accurate. And I'm saying so because I suspect naughtiness on the part of some board members of the SABC of wanting to assist the ETV case. The SABC, you know, previously it was captured by another broadcaster and I don't think the SABC is immune from being captured by another broadcaster. More so what they wrote to the correspondents to me indicate the arguments that have been raised by this other broadcaster, whereas we had had these engagements and the SABC and I were fully aligned on the issues because they have raised concerns previously around broadcast digital migration. We clarified the concerns they raised that in writing. I had a meeting with them, uh, with, with their uh, representatives of their board, and we wrote to them and said, this is the process we're doing to assure them of our support. And so that is the process, but I don't think they are immune from being used. And therefore what I'm simply doing is to say, if you are being used, you must account for you being used by other people. Some, they may be used away that they're being used, but others, they may have fallen on the trap because change is difficult and anxiety is difficult. But I cannot sit by and know that they've given me different sets of information and not alert parliament because I will then be part to the misleading of parliament. And I do not want to face the ethics committee knowing of parliament for misleading parliament. So that's the point. So I'll urge um, members of the portfolio committee before they summon the SABC to await the SABC to clarify to me which set of information is correct. However, uh, the members of the portfolio committee will have access to the letter of the speaker, all the correspondences between myself and the SABC, so that you can have a complete picture of what has transpired in this from the 7th of March until the 28th of, uh, of March. And that, that set of correspondence is attached as annexures to the letter of the speaker. So you will be fully, um, you will have full access to them. And they, these are part of the information that already leaked to the public in any case. And there will be an argument to say, Minister, you're saying the SABC has leaked, but you do not have evidence. The SABC wrote me a letter on the 7th of March. And I didn't respond to that letter until the 24th of March. And for reasons I stated earlier, that letter was never leaked to anybody. But immediately, I respond on the 24th of March. The letter that I sent to the SABC was in the public domain. Similarly, when I responded on the 27th of March, the letter that I sent was in the public domain. And those letters were sent directly from me to the chairperson who had an obligation to distribute to other members of the board because he could not keep the letter and say, this is what the minister said. All members of the board had to be given the letter. And there's a question of what have I done? We, we are, there is a point that I may have to come to this portfolio committee. I'm just checking the legal basis of it. There is a point where the SABC 
board is declining to be vetted by the state security in line of the vetting that is done with others. So we are, have requested and, uh, uh, the department to ascertain that whether that vetting is legally, it's a legal requirement for them in that board because it will be then truant if it is a legal requirement for the board to be vetted and not uh, to decline to be vetted. But vetted as they are arguing that they were vetted by the portfolio committee or by parliament when they were appointed. Whether it's correct, we may have to strengthen because the term of office of the board of the SABC is ending. We may have to strengthen our, our process of, uh, of appointing the board and include compulsory vetting so that we can determine whether these people that we appoint in the board of the SABC or any other board are able to keep this, uh, the secrets that they, they are entrusted to because with the type and level of responsibility that they sit with, you should not be suffering leaks at that level of the board. So where I am, I'm still determining whether legally there is that obligation. And if that obligation exists legally, we'll make sure that we, in, we inform the SABC the legal prescripts for it to uh, be taken. If they continue to decline, we'll then report them to the portfolio committee. And we'll have to find a way, and I'm happy that digital migration is finally taking place because at least in the digital economy, the, the correspondences will come with digital signatures and will be traceable to say who took it out. So we'll be able to, to find out who took it out uh, in, in the future. But today, I do not know whether we'll find out. But I will request, I'll write to the chairman of the SABC and request that they uh, find out who was responsible for the leak on their part. I must also clarify, there are no tensions between me and the SABC board. We have worked very well together with the SABC board. That's why I've supported them actively. I've supported the SABC board to get, for the first time, a PFMA exemption from the National Treasury. Though I would have preferred a five-year exemption, I've, they've granted uh, the SABC a one-year exemption, but which is renewable. Because I believe that they must be given space to operate. And because if for them to compete commercially, they must also have the, level, the playing field level to be competitive to their competitors. I've also actively, and I continue to actively support the SABC board on their request for the license waiver, license, TV license fee waiver. And I remain resolute that they must be supported because it's in the interest of the SABC that that waiver is done for their financial position to improve. Also, I've had uh, uh, submissions from the SABC that includes funding around um, public mandate and I actively support them. So it's not a board that I can say we, we have tensions that we cannot coexist. We, we have differences. The, unfortunately, I guess the stakes were too high in this time because I've always insisted in my correspondence with them, which I'm sure the speaker will give to yourself, that the national interest must supersede any other thing. And if there are challenges with the SABC, we could find a way of, of supporting the SABC that they should not collapse like we continue to do so today, even with their, their bailouts when we, we, we do the digital migration. But we believe that there are opportunities for the SABC, which the board must focus on instead of focusing on past technology. They must focus on future technology to make sure that they can remodel the organization to be an organization that is competitive in the future. Because if they resist, they will be left behind. On the, and these are the issues that were raised by all members, but uh, uh, they were initiated by Honorable Basopu, but all other members raised the same issues. I thought I've, I've given that, uh, that clarity, and I've also clarified the parliamentary responsibility that when the SABC has determined with set of information, I'll then come to parliament to say, you need to, you may have to redo the quarter reports or that they have withdrawn the other statements and, and we'll have to deal with what, what are the consequences of uh, playing gimmicks when the national interests are at stake? And we'll, we'll deal with it if they choose the other route. We'll, we'll come to this portfolio committee to parliament and uh, this portfolio committee to say, this is what we think in terms of law has been violated, or this is what we think in terms of law must be, uh, must be done. And you can apply your mind to yourself. You can then at that point activate your legal advice to say what are the options that the portfolio committee and parliament who are the appointing authority of the SABC board to do. On the deferment of the date to June and the concerns of that the population must be left behind and extending, we've argued and the court has contended that the, the, the right to be supported is matched by the responsibility to register. And that's why I've said, I've called for the free to air, safe free to air TV 
coalition to join us in creating this awareness. To say, don't just claim to speak for the poor. Go and get the poor to register because it's only when they've registered that they'll access this. And it's only when we have indicated government has not put a ceiling to say whether we're going to support 2.5 million households or five, the alleged 5 million households, which we believe are not there. In terms of statistics, we can confirm that they that may qualify for support. But like the court has said, some of those households may not even own an analog TV. Some of those households may be owning a different TV. So it's not true because we don't have those facts to say how many of those households own analog TV. But we appreciate the request to create a larger awareness. But just to update on that, we have now partnered because the SABC was appointed by the Strategic Committee to then do the awareness. And we have paid the, the SABC 30 million for that awareness uh, campaign. And we continue to pay SABC for the outcast, outside broadcast uh, that we utilize when we were on awareness our, ourselves as the department on this BDM. But we have, and the SABC radio stations have done well on that. The SABC TV also, for those who watch TVs on analog, there's a message that continue to speak to say, analog switch update is going to happen, go and register. What we are going to engage with them is that now that there is a date, that is said by court, which they of the 30th of the 30th of June 2022, the message must be specific to say go and the and the TV will be switched off by the 30th of June if you do not register for sub if you don't register to get the support and also to clarify there'll be those who register late they will also have to accept that they will be assisted late. But we've also partnered with uh, community radio stations in all provinces. They've come to the party. Bigger. They've been interviewing us. They've been interviewing citizens. They've continued at, uh, at, at the back or at the expenses of their own doing. And with the challenges of the support or the limitation of support that have been given, they've been continuing to, to get the message across. We've also now decided at the project steering uh, committee level that we are going to also uh, pay the community media, uh, community radio in particular to continue to communicate the message to their communities in their language so that we can then get this message across. We have also partnered with um, what councillors and the municipalities, the local municipalities and district municipalities across the country to continue to communicate the message, but also because what councillors and their what committees are aware of indigents in their households. We have also uh, give, we've started to give them forms to distribute to the indigent households and to also become the source of collection of those forms where our district coordinators and the support officials can also collect from them. We are now extending that partnership to the traditional leadership in the areas to start to say in an area where they are traditional leadership, invite us, not only the minister, but the district coordinators and the uh, officials to the uh, imbizos or community meetings that are convened by traditional leaders. It has worked well for us in, in some areas of KZN the way we've started, and that's where we are uh, we, we are going to ramp it up that way. And we appreciate the offer by Honorable Kubeka that we, how can the portfolio committee uh, assist? All members of parliament have constituency offices. We would like to use the constituency offices as the points wherein the application forms can be accessed because sometimes the, the, the post offices are far and also for the uh, people, uh, uh, citizens to drop back the, uh, the application forms for assistance and we can then collect them from, uh, from there. We'll make the necessary arrangement with, the, with the, uh, the whips of the various political parties and the, uh, the chief whip of the majority party uh, on, on this, uh, this matter. And we are committed to that nobody is left behind. And there was a, 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 an issue that was raised by Honorable Botani to say no policy has been developed. No, it's not accurate, Honorable Botani. You didn't hear me correctly. There is a policy, the broadcast digital migration policy that has been adopted since 2008. It was amended in 2011. It was again amended in 2012. And yeah, the, the, the policy is in place. And that policy prescribes what must be done for to reach the end of a dual elimination. That policy does not say government must subsidize households to access a set of boxes. It is a cabinet decision because the ANC is a current government for these people. It is a cabinet decision that says the governing party took at a cabinet level that poor households will be assisted to. Uh, access the set-top boxes. 
And that assistance is the one that we further clarified that to assess that, uh, to access that assistance, you must then apply for the, you must apply or register for that assistance at the nearest post office. And I've just explained what other places we're going to get people to get the forms, the sub forms to apply for. So that uh, I hope I've clarified that the policy. Policy is in place and there's a cabinet decision. The court has We have also made um, it to say that the, the, the non-governmental movement is, is claiming that WhatsApp where people apply is not responsive. There's no WhatsApp that people apply on. People send a message to WhatsApp on WhatsApp to say, uh, my device is not working, to say, where is the nearest post office? The people apply, if they're applying online, on a, on a www.stbregistrations.gov.za. And that site, it's zero rated. And it's also available, not only on smartphones, but on feature phones, the ones that are 100 rands. That you, you have to, you, that's where you apply. So we must clarify to the uh, members of the public that you don't apply on WhatsApp. There is a line that you apply on including the, the, the feature phone that you can use to apply on. We've given different configurations of the feature phones, what they use to apply. And that site is zero rated and we've communicated that. And Honorable Bodlani has questioned, has asked to say, we are determined that also apply after the 31st of October, we'll connect them between three to six months after the, after the analog switch of dates. What the court has now determined is that those who have applied by the 31st of October, 2021, must be connected by 30 June, 2022. And when they are, and that date is the date of the uh, dual elimination period ending and the switch off of analog and the full switch on of digital uh, broadcasting. Two, the court has further determined that the 30th of September is a date for those who have applied by the, between the 31st of, October and the 10th of is it, is 10th of February, no, 10th of, of March uh, 2022 to be connected. And that's what we said we are committing to those dates. We are going to wear, as we have indicated to court, we are going to determine the number that will apply after those dates. And we have committed that those who have still apply will make sure that nobody's left behind, will determine the final date. Remember, now the date of ASO has been postponed or deferred to the 30th of June. So if you count that, there will be another three months from 30th of June, which will take you 30th of September. And there'll be another three months after September, which will take you to uh, 30th of December. We'll then determine based on the volumes that we have to say, will that pre uh, situation be enough? But what we commit to is that we have also started activating procurement for additional um, uh, capacity that will require should the numbers go up should the, what the claims of the safe free to air TV coalition made to say millions will be affected and those millions are the poor who qualify for government support. It's, it turns out to be true. We've started to prepare ourselves for additional capacity so that we are responsive and we'll do all, our, all to the best of our ability to make sure that we connect people even after the analog switch off. But we must accept that the process cannot be perpetual. At some point we will have to determine a cut of date for those who apply, we'll uh, observe what are the responses in terms of the applications and then determine what are the cutoff dates uh, that uh, for the applications uh, to, to be received uh, and then so that the project can come to a close. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Minister. May I check if there are follow-ups members before we summarize and uh, move from this item? Ajira, any hand? Just to check, just to check, Chair. Okay, Honorable Madisha can proceed. Um, you can therefore, if you permit me, um, allow one to draw the conclusion that this has not come to an end as yet. We're still going to look into this thing. Um, I think the minister was uh, uh, very clear. Um, I mean, I'm talking about the, what the board has and continues to do, which like I said, when I started, um, one had wanted to raise a number of things, 
which in one's uh, understanding are quite wrong uh, in so far as the board is concerned. So is the minister then saying that we are still going to have a chance to discuss this thing? Um, I will stop there because if that is not the case, uh, one will raise other things in so far as that is concerned. But are we for now saying that uh, until such time we shall have received all the information as she has raised, uh, we still shall come back as the committee to look into that even uh, before at the end of June when uh, court processes will be going on. And ju I'm just wanting to be clear on that, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Honorable Matisha. Um, honorable members, uh, okay, I see that uh, the Honorable Machose hand is up. Um, honorable Machose. No, thank you, Chairperson. Um, mine is uh, it's, it's just a, a follow up question, maybe on the issue of set of boxes that I hear that, uh, unless I didn't hear clearly, but the minister will then um, uh, explain further that um, um, there's the, now we, we are no longer looking at the 30th of March, but we are maybe looking at end of June. So the messages that we've been receiving of people um, crying off the signal and also struggling to listen to the news and so forth. How are they going to then make sure that uh, maybe those people, they don't get uh, the same problem? Because which means continuously we are going to get these uh, concerns and messages that we keep on getting on our phones. So that um, then we know that if it's end of June, uh, they, then there will be uh, other measures that they will put in place to make sure that people do not struggle at home. Any other member that I may have left out? I think it's after the response, uh, if the minister and the team would want to respond, uh, thereafter we just summarize. Uh, any other member would want to make a follow-up? Okay, no. Uh, I take it that Honorable Minister, do you really want to come in at this point? Thank you. I need to clarify the point raised by Honorable Madisha to say on my part, when the SABC has determined which set of information is accurate, I'll equally inform parliament and, and parliament will then, I'm sure, delegate to the portfolio committee. The portfolio committee will then decide what to do with, with, that, in, with, with that information. But we will, uh, when we do that, we'll then uh, uh, explain further what are the optionalities. The portfolio committee, I think I need to indicate this Honorable Maneli and Honorable Madisha and other members, is that if there are issues the Portfolio Committee wants to re, uh, discuss that relates to the SABC, that members have a substantive uh, matters to raise, it would be prudent for members not to, to wait and say we want to whatever, but let's have an engagement to say there are these issues that we want to raise regarding the SABC or any other entity. Let's see if we cannot clarify it, if we can't clarify it or it warrants a discussion with the portfolio committee or uh, us appearing, we are willing to appear. So that Honorable Matisha should not be worried about whether when, if I reinstate the reports, the conversation around the SABC and other allegations that he says uh, uh, he's aware of uh, kept uh, swept under the carpet. There's no such an intention. So you should not be relying on the clarity that I'm seeking from the SABC that of which information is accurate to discuss other matters. You can raise the other matters that are in your in in your in your in in, in, in your in your purview and then we can respond. Honorable Malazi have just done so last I think it's last week and we are going to respond because he has asked pertinent questions and to, for us to clarify and we have we have activated that is return a letter will respond. If Honorable Malazi feels that in terms of the response that would have provided the meta warrants to be discussed at the portfolio committee level, we will be willing to subject ourselves to the portfolio committee level. In terms of Honorable Majosi, we need to uh, uh, confirm the analog switch off date has now been deferred to 30 June 2022. I must also clarify the message that you've been getting are not messages from citizens. They are sponsored messages from the safe free to air television that they were lobbying you. They were doing what you call public pressure for the members of the portfolio committee to sway the minister to change the date. 
because they realized that their court, the, case, the case they had in court was weak and therefore they wanted to do extra judicial and extra parliamentary uh, processes to, uh, to, 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 to put pressure on the minister. So that those messages are not from members of the public. Those who have been connected and we remain committed to the fact that those who, are, who, have, been, who have been connected have no issues of signal. Those who, have, uh, who reside in provinces that have already been switched off, the court has directed that as we connect these uh, people who applied before the 31st of October, 2021, uh, by uh, 30 June, 2022, we must prioritize the, those outstanding in the provinces of Limpopo, Northwest, um, Bumalanga, Free State, and Northern Cape. And that's what we're going to do exactly. And as, uh, as we progress, and when we make uh, the signature towards the 30th of June deadline, we will come to the portfolio committee and update the portfolio committee as much as we'll do that to the cabinet of the country in terms of our progress. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you, uh, Honorable Minister. Honorable members, I think uh, as we close on this item, firstly, we should really appreciate that the minister was able to come before the committee as this would have not been in the program of the committee, but purely a follow-up, uh, firstly informed by questions we asked, but secondly, also because as parliament, um, we have also responsibility of ensuring that there's public participation. And when civil society groupings also write to parliament, um, of course, different groupings have also been doing that, uh, writing either to the chair or to members directly. Uh, we have an obligation to also listen to what they are raising so that it gets clarified. And we use these sessions to also ensure that South Africans in general are clarified on where we are and uh, what is it that it's being done to address their, their concerns. I think that's for me an important aspect in terms of our role. If we are to ensure in the true sense uh, government of the people by the people. But I think what is important is that on the two matters, uh, firstly, the issue about quarterly reports that we've been briefed about as it relates to the SAPC. I think we should, uh, honorable members agree that we note that it's a provisional withdrawal. And of course, we need also to get a formal referral from the speaker for the consideration of the committee. So that we accept. <clears throat> and that, that referral will then make us to have a discussion based on the referral. However, uh, Minister uh, and honorable members, it should also be in our interest to look at what is happening in the public space and its implications to the work that we do as Honorable Dr. Basob would have raised, that some of these things would question our roles uh, as different uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, parliament playing its oversight role, processing these reports. The department itself has got an, over, an entity oversight uh, team that looks and scrutinizes these reports before they are put before us, uh, as well as the boards. Uh, in, in this case in particular, the independence of the SABC has been stressed many times and, and that we do not seek to take the work of the board. So the board also plays an important role in the governance of the entity as the SABC and they scrutinize these reports before they make submissions to the entity uh, oversight. And, 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 that, and therefore anything that gets raised in the public in that way, and it gets to be in the formal system of parliament uh, by notifying the speaker, it surely uh, also attract our interest uh, as the committee. And, and I think minister would be able to give the opportunity for the meetings that uh, you've spoken about, but it does not. 
takeaway. Uh, the fact that the committee needs to also engage the SABC, just to also get this balance that Honorable Malachi and other members would have referred to. I think Honorable Kubega uh, seconded that point, uh, that we should also hear the other side uh, of the story. I think very important for natural justice uh, in that way, uh, so that uh, we do not get to have the debate in the public uh, but that people can raise it uh, properly with the committee, especially because the committee plays a role in the appointment of the board uh, of the SABC and in no time would be uh, following the parliamentary process uh, to advertise for a new board of the SABC as the term comes to an end this year. And therefore our interactions must also help us to have lessons in terms of people and the caliber of leadership we bring in, in the entities. So, so, so I think it's, it's, it's important uh, because in the previous term, um, there was work done and as part of the legacy report, we would have received the, what the inquiry picked up in the SABC. Uh, and of course the appointment that happened at the time would have been about turning the situation around, right? Now, <clears throat> At this point, once you talk about uh, the turnaround strategy that the SAPC has put in, and, and we continue to say we are turning the corner, anything that creates doubt in that has got serious implications uh, going forward. Because the intervention we've made in the SAPC, if it turns around, Surely it becomes then an experience to use even in the other entities where we are to look at whether there's a recapitalization of some sort or bailout, if, 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 if you would want to call it that way. That indeed we give the assurance to South Africans that we do not throw money to problems, but we throw money to solutions. And that's why we fund the turnaround strategies. Uh, so if then there's misstatement of uh, facts and so on, it can create its own problems. Uh, but as I say, we do appreciate that you are calling it provisional, uh, but in determining our program as the committee, indeed we may want to have the SABC coming before the committee, uh, as well as the entity oversight uh, of the department, uh, which is in this case led by yourself, to come before the committee. But because we process reports that come before us, before we approve them, we also know that Santec also gave a sense of what the cost saving would be once the dual uh, remuneration is, uh, is switched off, in particular to the SABC. And, and these were not questioned uh, at the time in the presence of the SABC. Of course, the SABC raised uh, certain things around the cost uh, uh, of transmission from the side of uh, Centec, which was a matter being discussed. So, so I think we'd still need uh, to have that, but also give assurance to South Africans that if the SABC says, which is what is left in the public, that they would not be uh, able to take responsibility for the post uh, uh, market period, which, which is an important aspect of maintenance, um, of addressing queries from uh, society uh, post uh, the putting up of set of boxes and so on. I think it's important that we have that discussion uh, because the real people we must give assurance to in the May is South Africans who are delivering this service to, uh, that they will still be able to access the service at all material times so that they do not have negativity around change, but they must see change as transforming their lives for the better. So, so, so I'm just saying we may have to uh, still engage with you once we have set up our program for the next term. And we hope by that time, even the reports we would receive will show that progress has been made and those matters have been clarified and that we can assure South Africans that the money appropriated to SABC 
indeed will turn around uh, that institution and the facts are there to show. So, so that's on the SABC side. But I think on the part about uh, the switch off, we should also agree as members that we should indeed encourage people to register because in any way, the court decision has not come to a conclusion that there should not be an analog switch off and that we move to digital. It has only shifted the dates, but the program has to continue uh, in that way. So it's just to make sure that there are no people that are left behind. <clears throat> and I think as, as that briefing continues and urging people to register, uh, of course, PCO being used and all other avenues, uh, including community radio stations being used uh, and our national broadcaster still playing the role, uh, as well as mobilizing uh, the same civil society groupings that uh, they partner uh, with the government to ensure that South Africans who are eligible to register and receive support, that they get the support and that those that uh, are in the, in the unsubsidized market, we could also uh, ramp up the campaign of ensuring that they do know what to get, especially with the decision also from uh, uh, trade industry and in competition uh, around uh, products that get into the country, uh, which must comply to what the country's program is about so that we do not become a dumping site for, for, for what is not working out in the world there. That we can also ramp up that because a number of people may not be aware that just based on what they have already, uh, it would be easy for them to, uh, to migrate or they've already migrated in any way. Uh, so, so I'm just saying we need to intensify that with an understanding that the court has not really said there is no uh, BDM uh, or, or the policy is invalid or anything, but it's just about ensuring uh, that there's fairness and those that must access the service are able to, to access the service. So that's, I think for me, the summary uh, of that. And, and I take it that, uh, Honorable Minister, the point you are making is that even the dates, as you look at them, once you open up for those that may have not registered because of the confusion that may have been there, or access to either post office, depending on, on the area, given the challenges that may have also been there in the post office, which this committee is seized with that once those have been registered uh, fully, you'd be able to make a determination. And I also take it that as you go back, you will also be uh, working out that now that the court has made this determination, if you are reopening for those that may have not been in the dates that are outlined in the judgment, what would be the cutoff date? Because it also really can be open-ended, otherwise there will be no applications, but an expectation will be that there would be applications and you can stay in courts, I think, for, for quite some time. So I think the level of proactiveness that is needed is that that date gets to be communicated uh, widely uh, so that you can then measure on whether the 30th of September itself um, would mean that everybody else uh, over and above the numbers, uh, the 260 odd thousand uh, that are between 31st October and the 10th of March, that over and above that, uh, this is the number we have and whether we'll be able to get it by the 30th of September. At least we can be proactive in that once there is a proper cutoff uh, date for those that may have not applied, um, given whatever challenges they may have faced. Uh, so that our message uh, uh, to society will then be consistent. Uh, and that if anything else happens after that time, at least it would be known that it, it, 
it would have been those that believed they do not qualify to apply, hence they have not applied. And therefore you'd be able to focus on those that have applied, which is I think in line with uh, uh, the court decision in that score. So, so that's how uh, honorable members are going to summarize uh, the discussions uh, we've had on this point and in the way forward uh, thereof. Uh, and, and I take it that honorable minister, uh, that that is quite clear. Oh, I thought you wanted to speak because I saw you like, yes. Okay, so you're clear. Honorable members, I take it uh, that we are clear and we hope uh, that uh, society would be mobilized uh, in ensuring that those who qualify for assistance are assisted, but those that do not qualify are directed uh, exactly where assistance could be found for them to access what is uh, usable uh, in order to, to migrate. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, honorable uh, members, and thank you to the minister. As I said, honorable minister, it will really be your choice to stay. Uh, otherwise, we would still release you to determine the cutoff date uh, for the new applications. And, and that could be announced uh, earlier. We'll release you to go and meet with the SAPC, uh, clarify so that there's no withdrawal <laughs> that we can move forward. Uh, I thank you. You can. You can. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. And all the best to the portfolio committee. <laughs> Honorable members, we'll then uh, get to the next uh, item. I just wanted to check, Ajira, if we are going straight to this, or is it the uh, minutes time and the report? Jefferson, you indicated we'll adopt the report and then the minutes, and then we'll go to bit trading. Thank you, Chair. Can we, can we have the report slided? And we do as uh, Usually, two. That's the report for GCIS. Uh, that's the report we're considering. Like uh, we said, we needed to have these other matters sorted before. We adopt the revised uh, the revised APP report uh, that I would have communicated in the chat uh, group of the portfolio committee. Uh, so would only consider the GIS report, which should have been uh, looked at previously, but because of the corrections that needed to be effected, uh, it had to uh, then stay back and come back uh, for adoption today. So that's the report we're dealing with honorable members. We'll go page by page like we do.
We are now in observations. And go to recommendations. Just on, uh, on, on A there, on the entity, uh, the understanding of the 14 days um, is that uh, it does not uh, preclude the portfolio committee as per the discussions on the day uh, that we may want to get the board to of the MTD to come before the committee um, in the next term. It's one of those who would have to prioritize because if these matters are left unattended, they do affect uh, the governance of the entity which has been trying to turn its corner uh, after some years of problems. So I just wanted to uh, just stress that point so, so that it's understood when you get the draft program. Otherwise, uh, it's not about how it's captured in the report. Okay, if there are no points to be raised there, may I then for also for my honorable members to just get them over in second for the report. Honorable Bolani. Well, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, maybe just to cross the T's and dot the I's. The report makes an abbreviation of JCPC, PS, and ECID. Uh, I think it's the very first page, uh, just as a, a as a way of writing to just provide the That's definitions cool. of those. Uh, abbreviations and also on page three, the denomination of the rent value is missing. It does not say rent. I think there's an R missing to denote. Yes, on on point three, and I think subsequent again whether the the three hundred and seventy is again mentioned. So it's just a matter of crossing the T's and dotting the I's but the report is in order. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honorable Bolani. I get another member. I think those are clear, correction. Whilst you are waiting for another member, Chair, I can just assure the Honorable Member that by the time this report is published on the ATC uh, later today, uh, those abbreviations would have been uh, written in full. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ngom. I get a second. Chairperson, it's Honorable Kubega. Yes, yeah, I second the. <coughs> I second <laughs> yes. to, as the, okay. the, the Honorable Member have moved. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Honorable Kubek. That report is uh, seconded to those uh, corrections to be made before it's uh, sent for ATC. We are now in the minutes of uh, Tuesday, the 22nd March, I check if there's any member I wanted to make a correction in case I didn't hear you before we move for adoption. Chairperson? Is that uh, the Honorable Dr. Basso? I, I, I move the adoption of the minutes, but having a rider to say 
the correction should be done even before the reports are, are, are presented to us. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Honorable Dr. Basu. Um, may I get a second? Uh, Chair, it's Honorable Gubega again. I second the adoption of the minutes. Minutes adopted. Uh, any objection in us? Adopting the minutes, I didn't ask that uh, earlier. I take it that there are no objections. And therefore, we agree. I then check, Ajura, if uh, there's any other item except uh, the one uh, on the vets, which is in our session. No further item, Chair, except the vets session. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if uh, they're already connected, if you can check on that, and that uh, we can proceed as such. We already connected, no. Chair. Yes, Chairperson, the uh, delegation is connected. We have Ms. Ajam, who just spoke now. We have Ms. Trudy Hudsonberg, and thank you very much. Okay, I would, uh, without waste of time, uh, once again, welcome uh, the Vetsling Center is represented by Mr. Jam and, and the team. And I'm sure you'll uh, do proper introductions as, as, you, as you take stage. Honorable members, like we said uh, previously, uh, when we're reminding yourselves of this session, uh, that our work with the Vetsling Center has been that of uh, empowering capabilities of members as they handle different matters. We know that uh, this would not be uh, dealing with every aspect uh, that comes before this committee, but uh, everything else thus far with what we have gone through uh, with the Link Center, we, we can only say the members would have been empowered to engage even better on matters uh, that come before the committee. The good thing is that uh, we do not get to meet the Vetsling Center because we have to make a decision. But it's just an empowerment in terms of information such that at the time we have to make decisions, we can also look from an academic grounding in a way. Um, so, so that's how we take it. And, and the participation of members, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's something we would really want to encourage all, all the time. Um, the one hour is worth it uh, that we usually go through. Um, and, and we do this because we also know uh, this competes with many other programs members are engaged in. So please feel uh, uh, welcome and, and that the, the stage is now yours uh, in terms of the presentation you'd want to make to members. Thank you. Good morning, Honourable Chair and uh, Honourable Members. Uh, I'm Professor Tanya Jam from the School of Public Leadership at Stellenbosch University, and we are collaborating with Dr. Lucy Abrams from the Link Centre in Wits. Uh, we tend as her apologies because unfortunately she is in Rwanda at the moment. I will be supported by the rest of my team, uh, Professor Ayad Al-Ani uh, from the Einstein Center in Berlin. He will introduce himself when it is his turn to speak. And then also Dr. Trudy Hartzenberg from the Trade Law Center, uh, and she will introduce herself. Uh, so what we envisage is to go through the first half of the presentation and then uh, take a round of questions before we move into the second half of, of the presentation. Um, I'm going to ask your indulgence to turn off my camera and then I will share my screen uh, so that you can see uh, the presentation. Just let me know uh, that it's visible, um, you know, when it's supposed to appear. No, you, you are permitted, please do.
quite visible. Can you kind of do it? Yeah, that's excellent. Um, so I've just given some brief introductions and then let's move on to the substance of the presentation. I think we, the committee is well aware that digitization will affect every aspect of the South African economy and the society in some positive ways, but also in some negative ways. For example, uh, when we look at the introduction of robotics in emerging economies, we see that job losses in emerging economies are much greater than in the developing, developed country uh, counterparts. And um, you know, as the committee is well aware, um, for many years, our um, digital policy has stalled, but finally, after about 18 years, we've seen the auction of high demand spectrum last week, and uh, this opens up new opportunities for 5G and uh, also raised money for the fiscus. What is of concern to us is the digital divide. We know that the income inequalities that we see in the physical, um, in the, we are concerned that the inequalities that we see in the physical economy are not replicated in, spy, in cyberspace and also are not amplified. Like many other countries, South Africa has developed strategies to deal with the digital economy and to adopt new technologies while safeguarding more conventional sectors which are still following the traditional industrial model in order to preserve jobs and exploring financing options for managing this digital transition. However, the strategies that we see are still not sufficiently comprehensive across different sectors in the economy, and they don't fully address the multidimensional role of the state in digital evolution. However, the minister has announced a few days ago on the summit on unlock unlocking the potential of South Africans digital economy, that there will be a new framework and plan towards the digital economy and beyond by 250, which will be made available for comment. And this will uh, hopefully provide more details of I'm not sure it's on my side. I also can't hear. I'm not sure if we lost her or what. Yes, it seems uh, because on my side, I can't hear anything now. Yes, we've lost her. Not Jay. even the screen, you know. I will check with her, Chair. Honourable Chair, with your indulgence, perhaps Ayad and I could introduce ourselves to you and the honourable members while we wait for Tanya to join us. Yes, yes, please proceed. Thank you. Honourable Chair, honourable members, it's a great pleasure to join you this morning. I'm Trudy Hartzenberg from the Trade Law Centre Trullock. We work on international trade matters. And as you can probably imagine, in recent times, we've been extremely busy following the developments on the African continental free trade area. And as we speak today, there's an expert meeting on digital trade. So I look forward to sharing some of these developments with you. Thank you.
Yes, uh, good morning also from my side, uh, honorable members of the parliament, dear ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ayat Al Ani. I'm a, a member of the Einstein Center for Digital Future in Berlin. I'm also Associated Professor Extraordinary at the School of Public Leadership at Stellenbosch. Uh, and uh, um, I focus very much on the role of the state in implementing digitization strategies. And this will be also my topic uh, once my colleague uh, is coming back into the system and then we can start. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um... I, I take it you've just been able to connect back. Uh, you can unmute and, and proceed. Yes, uh, let me try and share my screen again. Uh, sorry about that. Um, the host has disabled screen sharing. So maybe if you can uh, um, give me permission to share my screen. Adjiro. So that's the. You've got permission, Ms. Okay. Uh, thanks very much for that permission. Uh, let me just move on. Okay, can I confirm that my presentation is visible and audible? We can hear and see Ms. Ajah. Okay, that's perfect, thank you. So when we look at these strategies that South Africa has adopted, uh, there's normally assumed that the state will play a significant role in uh, supporting that transformation. Uh, that's the role of the digital uh, partner state. But what the digital partner state is and how it should perform is much less known. But what we do know is that the current very hierarchical command and control centralized production and governance within governments will need radical rethinking as technology changes. Uh, we see this, for example, in energy as we move from um, centralized production of energy, um, electricity to renewable energy, for instance, and in water. So it's uh, affecting many different sectors of the economy. The state will have to assume new roles that are linked to digital transformation in the economy. Uh, it needs to change what it does, but it will also need to change how it does it in order to leverage external capacity in civil society, um, you know, in NPOs, in the private sector, in order to make sure that its scarce resources are not overextended. And this doesn't have to be a big bang approach, but can be, uh, phased in through selective digitization and opening up of the relevant state interfaces towards productive forces with which the state can collaborate. My colleague, Professor Alani, will speak a bit more about that when he gets to the analytical framework. From an academic perspective, the role of the digital partner state is still evolving, and this presentation will explore the technocratic role of the South African digital partner state and the capacity that it must develop. And it will also look at different case studies to apply that conceptual framework and to understand the different policy domains. So uh, we will be focusing on the role of the state as regulator, as innovator, as distributor, enabler, in those particular case studies with a particular focus on using these roles to try and overcome the digital divide and to promote digital inclusion in our economy. We'll be looking at trade management. Uh, my colleague Trudy Hartzenberg will focus on that. Uh, we'll look at smart cities. Uh, we'll look at the role of the state as distributor in single window trade management platforms and the state as enabler in open post-school education. So that's quite a diverse range of different um, sectors. So now I will hand over to my colleague, um, Professor uh, Al-Ani to speak to the analytical framework. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya. So in the, in the next couple of minutes, I would uh, like, with your permission, to talk about 
the specific attributes that uh, public services have in the digital sphere. And there is something really special about that and very different from the, from the traditional role. So we, maybe we should talk about that for a couple of minutes. And also I want to show you some international examples on how to build these services. So there is also a distinctive kind of change management process behind that. Uh, on the next slide, um, you can see that uh, public services, if we consider them being delivered via digital platforms, they have some very distinctive attributes. First of all, what is a, what is a platform? Well, in the, in the most generic way, one could say that a platform is a virtual space that facilitates value creation uh, via online transactions between two or more parties. And um, those platforms have some specific attributes. One is uh, integration. So you can bundle lots of services, not only from one provider, but from many providers. You could also include services from uh, external providers, private providers, and bundle them to uh, create a comprehensive offering. Personalization, that's also very interesting and in that sometimes uses machine learning and artificial intelligence as the, the user can then specify on the platform what is interesting for him or for her, or sometimes the platform, when it uses machine learning, can also assume or can, can, can also predict what kind of services are interesting for this person. Outreach, of course, uh, when we use the digital sphere, uh, we can use more and broader groups with lower transaction costs. And of course, those services are always on. They are available 24-7. There, there is a network effect. Uh, and that is, uh, I would say, one of the most important distinctions between uh, a virtual public service and a traditional one is then it gets better the more it is used. So in the, in the physical sphere, we have the phenomena that uh, the more services are used, the, the scarcer they, they get, uh, the, the more competition is around them. Uh, but here in the digital sphere, uh, usually services get, get better because uh, more people participate. People will improve those services uh, when they amend them, when they communicate um, about them, and uh, when they also participate in the production. Uh, which brings me to the point of the producer, as mentioned by uh, Professor Ajam. Uh, citizens will not only be passive receivers of services, but they can via the platform also be partners in the production in improving and in amending services. So you immediately have a huge workforce that uh, can be used delivering public services. And of course, those users can also be connected uh, to make them more, more productive. So these are the, the key um, aspects. And I will show you, if you permit me, two or three examples to, to clarify the points. On the next slide, you see the example of, of a German public broadcaster. This broadcaster uh, right now is delivering uh, two or three TV channels and about 25 radio stations in the area of uh, Berlin and, uh, and uh, the adjacent uh, regions. Uh, but it did not have a presence in the, in the internet. So, the uh, broadcaster decided to build a platform. And you can see the different functions which I ex explained just a minute ago appear here again. So you have the bundling on services, multimedia, that is all um, radio stations and all TV stations can be accessed at, at one point uh, via this platform. So that's the easy part, of course. Then you have something we call it hyperlocal in German. That's you use also the citizen as a producer of, of news and, and stories, and you can integrate these citizen reporters into this platform. So you're using your audience as a kind of news agency. You also provide with this platform uh, for a community to speak, uh, giving, giving voice to people that have not uh, had a voice before you and, and you can connect them. You also um, make sure that this platform can be personalized. That is, uh, you can either provide a profile saying, this is what I want to have, and this is what I don't want to have, 
or the machine can make a suggestion ba based on your behavior. And of course, what's also interesting is that the, the area around Berlin, uh, out of historical reason, is quite poor compared with the rest of the country. So we assumed here, for instance, that it would be interesting for, small, for smaller uh, uh, companies and smaller service providers to also be included on the, on the, on the platform. So you are, as, as a public platform, giving them a, a space to uh, demonstrate their, their services. And you can integrate those services also on your platform. So this is quite a comprehensive view. Uh, if I am allowed to, to switch to, to another sector, totally different. Uh, can you have the, the slide before, Tanya, please? Uh, the, the topic of culture. Uh, here, this is a project that we're doing for the, for the Middle East area uh, in uh, uh, geography. And what is interesting here is that we are asking museums, for instance, to digitize their, their artifacts. Uh, that's also saving them in case they get lost and during conflicts, wars, what, whatever, or lack of funding. So we have uh, building a database for all the artifacts of museums in the Arab world. And then as a, as a consumer, so to say, you can have access to all of them uh, via, your, via your PC. And uh, you see on the, on the left side that we are building some kind of search engine where you can look for the things that are interesting to you, uh, either by geography, by the, by the objects, or by the, by the um, timeline, meaning the, the period of history that, that, that you are looking for. Um, we are also providing on the, on, you see that on the, on the right side, museums, the opportunity to digitize for themselves. So we are offering them a toolbox, we are offering open source software, so they can digitize their artifacts and also create virtual kind of exhibition. So you see this, this tool has two sides. It, it gives the consumer, so to say, the, the, the citizen more access to, to cultural artifacts, uh, but it also gives a museum help in uh, digitizing their, their uh, physical um, artifacts. On the next side, on the, on the next slide, you see uh, another different topic. And uh, um, Tanya, could you, could you move to that? Thank you. And uh, my, uh, the, yeah. uh, my apologies that some of the descriptions are in German, but I can translate very well. Here, we, we try to imagine how an army could, could look like as a, as, a, as a platform. And at the center, of the idea was that you can via machine learning and by artificial intelligence already now predict very well where conflicts will, uh, will appear. And you can also estimate uh, when they will appear. And if you have, if you, if you know the future, you can, you can change the future as well. And the idea here is to create an ecosystem uh, in the area of security and defense consisting also on of uh, the administration of uh, media, civil society, social media, culture, uh, to uh, then help creating solutions for this, for this conflict. And the idea is that um, if you can anticipate a conflict very well, you still have time to create different solutions and you can use the platform to, to uh, integrate services that uh, hopefully then uh, can elevate this, the situation because most of the conflicts have uh, are arising around scarce re resources, that's land, water, what, whatever, lack of services. Uh, and these are then things you can, you can change. And if, if that needs then armed forces, uh, that's, that's uh, still also possible, but that's, that's not the first thing you do. The first thing you do is you try to anticipate the conflict and try to resolve it. And a platform can help you very much. So you can see, the, the army in this picture looks totally different than, than, uh, than an army in the, in the traditional world. And it, it uses the same principles like bundling, outreach, and community building as the um, two examples before. So if I'm allowed to, to conclude, what is the role of the state in this uh, on, the, on the next slide? Um, as as uh, Professor Ajam has already said, we can we can see also when we look at it from an international perspective that there are four major roles. One is the innovator, uh, so the state is supposed uh, to create strong innovative cases that that will then 
be re reused and can also uh, shine, so to say, into the, into the rest of the economy and society using linkage effects. Uh, the state can also be a, a distributor. Uh, like the examples before, the state does not need to provide all the services, but the state then can provide a platform that can bundle different services and provide them to the, to the citizens. And of course, the state is a regulator that uh, is supposed to keep the digital sphere open and secure and, and honest. Uh, and also the state is an, is an enabler. So um, uh, the, the citizen is taking a more active part here and then needs support in that. So I'm, I, I have to apologize for this complex uh, graph here, but this is, as I see it, one of the, the only ones where we can see on one page what the state is supposed to do. And uh, we can see in the middle, we have this uh, uh, modest box called technology. And here we have te technologies like artificial intelligence. We have technologies in the area of automation, uh, of uh, virtual reality, virtual augmentation, blockchain. And those technologies are being used by the traditional sector, by the traditional corporation, and also by startups. And uh, we see the role of the state as a digital partner state. So the, what the state can do is on one side, support startups to pick up those technologies uh, uh, via, via investments, uh, via infrastructure, via giving them blueprints that, 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 that means um, the source code of the, of, the, of the product or the services for free. Those startups then will produce something very innovative and they can pass it on the, to, the, to the traditional cooperation. So what we see in many places is that traditional cooperation is using startups to, to renovate themselves and make them more in, innovative. Uh, and of course, the digital partner state can also support the traditional sector by enhancing those cooperations and by um, enforcing also or supporting light tower projects that, that use those new technologies. And then once they are successful, pass it, pass it on to, to uh, other sectors and other companies. And of course, the state uses platforms uh, to, um, for, for, for doing that, because these are, as I tried to show before, are very simple and very innovative and very cost efficient ways of distributing products and services, ideas, and also collaborations. So uh, supply and demand of workforces, this is something that the state can also do. And last but not least, and this is something that uh, Tanya Ajahn will focus on as well, if the citizen will um, obtain the role as a producer, meaning as a producer and as a user, uh, then the producer will need to learn for his or her entire life. And therefore, in this new role, we need a different view on how education will work. And of course, education will also be working or can be delivered as a platform. Finally, I would like to show you two examples of countries that are uh, working on this. So one is Tunisia. And here you can see in Tunisia, as you know, a, a country with lots of problems, a, a very limited public funding. Uh, so what we discussed with them is, you know, can we create two or three light tower projects that are using technology that are collaborating uh, with, uh, with startups in order to create very innovative solutions that can then be transferred to, to other sectors. Uh, and you see on the, on the right side, we try to figure out where those light tower projects should be situated. And we were using uh, some kind of evaluation scheme saying, okay, we should focus on industries that have very high employment effects or have linkage uh, effects or uh, are very strong in the area or very important in the area of, of export. And then once you have this, this evaluation matrix in front of you, you can then decide together with the, with the traditional industry sector or, or startups, you know, where to focus on. So you, you don't have too many bullets, but you have some and you should use them very wisely and with a, a huge leverage effect. On the, on the next side, you see the uh, <clears throat> case of India, also very interesting. India has uh, pronounced a strategy called artificial intelligence for all. And the idea here is that uh, the, the issue, underlying issue is that 
things like algorithms, the usage uh, of, of data, obtaining relevant data is something very expensive. And for many companies, uh, especially uh, small, medium-sized ones, or even the informal sector, this is absolutely difficult or even impossible. So the idea of India is to provide a kind of library for relevant data, which of course has been neutralized, and also for algorithms that uh, companies, uh, also universities and uh, government agencies can, can use to build their own solutions. Uh, so they will create a kind of public good consisting of a data which has been curated, which has been uh, uh, neutralized in a way, uh, and they are providing this for different functionalities of companies and you can use that for free and the idea is that you that you use it you can even improve it and then uh, upload it again to the uh, to the to the library so the idea is that this library gets better the more people use it with that um, i want to thank you for uh, making this short speech possible and we will see on the next presentation by my colleagues uh, how we could implement those ideas in South Africa. Thank you very much. Okay, so it's uh, back to me and I'll briefly be looking at the evolution of digital policy in South Africa. Uh, this is going to be a recap for the members because uh, I think that many of them would be well aware of the National Development Plan that in 2012 envisaged that by 2030, we have a seamless information infrastructure which will be universally available and accessible and will meet the needs of citizens, business and the public sector, providing access to the creation and consumption of a wide range of converged services required for effective economic and social participation at a cost and quality of at least equal to South Africa's main competitors and peers. And the NDP itself uh, set for a vision and some key milestones for achieving that, including the need for an integrated infrastructure plan in which public and private information and communication technology investment was channeled into broadband applications, local content development in order to drive the growth of various sectors in the economy, that the market structure needed to be reviewed, that institutional capacity needed to be built for effective uh, regulation, that demand side measures included digital literacy, ICT incentives and developing applications in health education and other sectors and addressing the digital divide through regulation to create more competitive markets, affordable pricing and also smart subsidies. This was followed by the National Integrated ICT uh, Policy White Paper in 2016 which outlined the building blocks of a vibrant, equitable digital economy and society and repeated many of the key milestones which were mentioned in the NDP. Uh, in uh, 2017, the National East Strategy, Digital Society South Africa was adopted, which included a focus on ICT research and development, filling the ICT skills gap, sector-specific interventions and fostering a digital industrial revolution. Last year, Cabinet adopted the National Digital and Future Skills Strategy, and at sector level, there have been many uh, strategies as well, including the education sector, health sector, integrated justice cluster, and e-government more broadly. The latest has been the Presidential Commission on 4IR report, and this Influential report envisages a critical role for the state as regulator, enabler, distributor, and innovator. So um, I'll just take a few excerpts from that report to illustrate the point. Uh, on the regulatory role of the state, the report recommends overhauling legislation to create a, an environment which is more conducive to rapid commercialization at scaling up of new technologies and processes. Uh, this would include appropriate regulatory and tax regimes, new incentives to support uh, startups, application of advanced uh, technologies in manufacturing services, government procurement to uh, foster uh, 4IR technologies, 
developing infrastructure priorities, plans and timelines in the state's role as enabler and innovator, investment in massive skills development, establishment of an artificial intelligence institute, creation of the post of chief data officer within the state, and that ComSec, the state's cybersecurity company, be strengthened. So clearly to play those roles, it's assumed that the state has the requisite capability. Um, what we've noticed, uh, as I mentioned before, is that in while policies are quite comprehensive, we as a country have lagged in implementation. Uh, with that, I will hand over to my colleague uh, Trudy Hartzenberg to speak to us on two case studies, uh, trade management and uh, the single window application. Over to you, Trudy. Am I the only one there? We are here, Chairperson. I'm the one that's here, the other side. Apologies, apologies. There seemed to be a, a glitch in the communication this morning, which is rather apt since we're talking about digitization. Honorable members, honorable chair, it's a great pleasure to speak to you about trade management. And we're going to look very briefly at the role of the state as regulator and how digitization may support more effective, transparent um, regulation of both imports and exports of goods and services that come into our country, but that are also exported to our key trading partners. We'll also take a look at the state as a distributor, as Ayad has mentioned, and look at the use of platforms to enhance trade governance and regulation. Sovereign states regulate what enters and leave their territories through domestic regulation, but also what they agree in international trade agreements. Keep in mind that South Africa is a member of the Southern African Customs Union, SADC, the Southern African Development Community, has also ratified the African Continental Free Trade Area, Although, as I've mentioned earlier, we're currently negotiating a protocol on digital trade. It also has agreements. Thanks, Tanya, we'll stay with this one for a couple of minutes. And we, of course, have trade agreements with key global partners, the European Union, the United Kingdom, and a number of others. But let's take a look at what kind of trade regulation can be effectively digitized. When we take a look at the trade in goods. Of course, there are import duties to be paid. That's very important for the fiscus. There are also regulations to protect human, animal, plant health, and increasingly to protect the environment. Now, from this list of regulations, we immediately see that there are a number of different government departments and agencies involved in trade regulation. So in addition to di digitization of specific regulatory instruments, we see that interagency cooperation is extremely important to make sure that our borders are managed effectively so that there's integrity of customs and border management processes. But let's take an example to clarify some of these issues. 
In recent years, if we take a look at South Africa's fruit exports, apples and citrus fruits have been notable success stories. And we export a lot of apples to other countries on the African continent. Now, when we export apples, those consignments of goods have to be accompanied by certificates to guarantee that they will not harm human, animal, plant health, or the environment. And some of the regulations relate to pesticide usage and the residues of pesticides, which are often so important to manage very carefully. If we exceed the permissible levels of pesticides on the apples, they will not be exportable. So that's particularly important to keep in mind. We will also find that as the goods move across border posts, they will need to be accompanied by a certificate of origin, specifying that they come from South Africa, that they've been grown, produced in South Africa. That's important so that we know which the applicable rate of duty is going to be. So already we see that SARS, our revenue services, will be involved. The Department of Agriculture will be involved because, of course, they will issue the certificate, the sanitary and phytosanitary certificate, attesting to the fact that this product is safe for human animal consumption and will not harm the environment. When it comes to trade and services, and this is increasingly important for South Africa, during COVID, we've seen a significant increase in cross-border supply of services digitally enabled. As we're doing today, we've also seen in education, for example, digital and online learning platforms have been developed very successfully. And these are all conduits for the supply of those services. In some countries, it's also possible to supply health services via a particular platform. But very important also when it comes to trade and services, services suppliers often need to travel into our territory in order to consume a service. And a really good example, also a sector that has been so hard hit during COVID is tourism. And we're starting to see the coaches coming back in Cape Town, so tourism is picking up again. But a tourist would need a visa, and may also still need a PCR certificate in order to assure that they are COVID free. A very important conduit also for the supply of services is via the movement of a services supplier. And here we may have doctors coming from Cuba to support our healthcare system and supply services in our hospitals we would need to know what their qualifications are, their experience and expertise. And we would have to have a mutual recognition agreement with the country of origin. Again, very important aspect of regulation to assure the safety of the patients who will be treated. So these are examples of the kind of regulation of trade in goods and trade in services. Very important, the increase in digital trade, again, grown quite significantly during COVID. If we take a look at a subset of digital trade, e-commerce, you and I have become quite used to ordering online certain products and, and services, for example, using Uber. So I would order a ride online and the Uber driver would arrive at my door to provide that transport service. This requires a new generation of trade regulation, which governs cross-border data flows, the storage of data, the location of storage of the data, privacy, consumer protection, and also cybersecurity regulation. But the reality is where we stand today, and this comes from SARS annual report 2021, an admission that customs and excise, so customs and border management effectively, is still grappling with manual and paper-driven processes. So we are on a customs modernization journey that started about 20 years ago, but we're still battling in this first phase to some extent. 
We are moving along and digitizing some instruments, electronic certificates, for example, but we can certainly move along quite significantly to improve the digitization process. Next slide, please, Tanya. As I mentioned, the Customs Modernization Program started almost 20 years ago. It's divided into various phases. And the phase that we're looking at now, which started last year, will run through until 2024. And the kind of improvements in terms of regulatory functions, the digitization processes include the development of smart borders, where we will see number plate recognition for fleets as those trucks come across the borders, for example, scanners, smart scanners, body cameras, and, and so on. But I would like to look at a couple of issues on the right-hand side of this slide. Just for the record, this comes from a presentation done on International Customs Day in January this year. I'd like to focus briefly, first of all, on cross-border e-commerce. And some of the issues that we've spoken about are particularly important. This is where courier companies play a very important role. But our goods that we order online from outside the country still have to cross the border. Duties are still to be paid. There are safety checks related to certain products and technical regulations have to be complied with. So there is still an enormous collection of regulations that have to be complied with. The state plays a very important role in e-commerce regulation. Very important step we're taking is our authorized economic operator program or the preferred trader program. So this is a program where less checks are required for those companies that have a good compliance record. They are authorized economic operators or preferred traders. Now, a very important step would be for us to have a mutual recognition agreement with our trade partners. So if a company is certified as an authorized economic operator in South Africa, that would be recognized by our trading partner. And their trade would also be expedited in terms of the compliance requirements on the other side of the border. Very importantly is the single window. And this is where we move Tanya to, and I think we can skip over the next couple of slides quite quickly to the single window. These slides, there are two of them, which cover some of the issues I've spoken about. And just before we look at the single window, let's just recap. When we take a look at trade regulation, the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition and the International Trade Administration Commission are responsible for issuing export and import permits, for example, for regulating aspects of, of trade that, that may in fact be harmful, so arms and ammunition and so on. The Revenue Service, of course, they're interested in the duties that have to be collected, the import duties or sometimes export duties as well. Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development is responsible for assuring that those products are safe for human consumption, do not harm the environment or, or animals, for example. So these are quite important to keep in mind. Very important recommendation we'd make is that we need a comprehensive review of our trade policy. The latest iteration of our trade policy is a trade policy statement, which was published in May last year. It's a very short document, about five pages. It includes the foundational coverage of trade policy, but does not have the detail for this kind of regulatory reform and development to be appropriate to what is essentially a 21st digital economy now. We no longer talk about the digital economy and the rest of the economy. It's fair to say the economy has gone digital to all intents and purposes. Next slide, please, Tanya. This again, just very important when we take a look at trade. There are two sides to a trade transaction. 
one country would be the exporting country, the other is the importing country. So a good passes across the border and has to be regulated on both sides of that border. And therefore, cooperation, regulatory harmonization with our partner countries becomes extremely important. It smooths the trade process. That value chain becomes more secure as goods leave the factory gate and end up on the supermarket shelf bought by a consumer and are consumed safely and securely, having been well regulated within that integrated value chain. We move now in the next slide to the single window. Thanks, Tanya. Can go on to the next one where we'll see a depiction of, of a single window. And this really is where we take a look at the state as the distributor and how platforms are used. And in recent years, I'd say in the last two decades, what we have seen internationally is a move towards a single window platform management system of international trade. How does it actually work? Before we do that, just take a look very briefly at the advantages of working through this platform. It supports an improvement in trade governance, transparency, predictability, but also reduces the burden of basic paperwork, which can often hold up processes at the border posts and some of you may be well aware with, with the blockages that we find, for example, at the Bike Bridge border post, where queues could be kilometers long and trucks could be stuck for five days during peak periods. So it really is to expedite those processes. From a business perspective, so from a trader perspective, whether we're importing or exporting, the reduction in transaction costs could be significant. A 40-foot container going on, on a flatbed truck could require as much as 2,000 papers, documents that would accompany a consignment of goods which may include consumer goods, food products, and so on. But from a business perspective, and I think this is so important, business wants legal certainty, predictability, and transparency. And this is also possible with a single window platform. So how does it work? And let's start with the green figures. This comes from a World Bank document, but it, it gives us a very good idea of how the single window works. On the regulatory side, so look at the state as regulator, the Department of Agriculture. They issue those certificates to assure that the product is safe to consume industry, Technical regulation. So when you and I buy an imported plug, it will fit into the socket at home. Those are the technical regulations that have to be complied with. On our part, that will also require that the South African Bureau of Standards has actually issued a certificate for, of compliance for that export product if we're exporting it. The Ministry of Trade and its related agencies, such as the International Trade Administration Commission, they issue licenses, import, export permits. And again, during COVID, we saw many of those being necessary to export or import food products, medicines, drugs, medical equipment, which was so necessary to deal with, with the pandemic. Customs, this Customs officers at the border post play a very important role. They check the documentation, the classification of the product, because that will determine what the rate of duty is that has to be paid. They make sure that the duties have been duly paid. So effectively, they are also part of the government system. There are fees to be paid. So if we're taking a look at port fees, maritime transport, then those are so important as well. And here we have the stakeholders involved from the private sector, the freight forwarders, the carriers, the shipping lines, 
Um, and of course, the traders themselves, if we're looking at small scale traders who actually cross the border with consignments of goods to facilitate the payment of fees, charges and duties, the banks are involved too. So how does this work? A single window platform would be where I, as an exporter of apples, would register my company once. And all the requisite agencies would have access to that registration in order to check my company details, the consignment of goods that I'm exporting. And also this would be where I apply for my certificate of origin, my health certificate, and any other licenses which may be necessary in the single window platform. So all the documentation would be collected and available. So when the consignment comes to the border post, the customs officer would simply access all of that information, scan the consignment, and I would move through the border check process very, very swiftly. So this is how the single window would work. Tanya, let's just move on to the next slide. This, um, I'm coming to the end of, of my contribution, is just such an important point that Ayad has also made. Let's take a look at international experience. What can we learn from what other partners um, that we trade with are doing? And this is an example of China's international trade single window. Now, what they've done is very similar to the process, the platform I've just described, but they also provide access to their platform, to their trade partners. So it really becomes an ecosystem of trade governance regimes that apply not only to a single country, a single jurisdiction, but it now links also to our trading partners. So in fact, if a good is being exported from Kenya to South Africa, then the Kenyan authorities would be able to access that digital platform so that we would know exactly what would be exported. Are the health certificates in place? Have any export duties that have to be paid already been paid? So this is a step up in terms of the international trade single window. And now we see government to government and agency to agency across jurisdictions cooperating in, in a regulatory governance arrangement through a digitally enabled platform. They become distributors, but there is extremely important international cooperation. Tanya, just two last points, and I think I've mentioned most of these, these already. I think we can skip through those. Could we go to the next one, please, Tanya? This point, and let's look at the bullet just in the middle of the page, the regulations for the implementation of the Border Management Authority Act. As our members would know, we have passed a Border Management Authority Act and the Department of Home Affairs has become the focal point, the focal agency for border management. Now, this is so important because immigration also plays a very important role in terms of managing borders. And they're very important in terms of, for example, consumers coming to consume tourism services or medical doctors, accountants, engineers coming to supply those professional services because they would need a visa or a work permit. So what we start to see, it's a rather large number of government agencies, sometimes 10, 11, 12, or 13, that are all involved in effective border management. Focus very often is on revenue generation, collection of duties, but increasingly we're also looking at the integrity of our border systems and how these different agencies can and must work together and the single window provides a very important opportunity for us to move into the digital space for governance. But what we do need to keep in mind is this requires new capabilities, new skills, new infrastructure, and new interoperability 
amongst those systems. So there is a great deal that we need to do to move away from paper-based systems into this digital platform arrangement where the state as a distributor effectively manages its borders and facilitates trade rather than having long queues as we sometimes see. Thank you so much. I'm pleased to hand over to my colleagues. Honorable Chair, at this juncture, I just want to get some direction from you. We're roughly halfway. Would you like a round of questions to Professor Alani and uh, Dr. Hartzenberg on the presentations at this point? Or would you prefer that we finish the presentation and then take all the questions afterwards? Uh, I, I think from my side, uh, it would be good to just get the presentation. I think members have been noting points where they would want to engage uh, and that we would still have members by the time you finish the presentation, I'm breaking it in between. Thanks, Am I Jay. representing you well, members? Yes, yes, you can proceed then. Okay, great. So Trudy uh, Hartenberg discussed uh, the application of digitization in the trade space, specifically looking at a single window. Uh, what I want to focus on is the role of the state as innovator in a gradual transition to smart cities. Already a range of South African cities have been venturing into the smart city uh, space, and they've been providing uh, free Wi-Fi to libraries, clinics, public open spaces. For example, City of Chwane, uh, Itaquini Metro, City of Johannesburg, uh, City of Cape Town. But there's been considerable variation in the approaches that different cities have used. Some have partnered with uh, NPOs, for example, City of Chwane has partnered with uh, Project Isizwe. Others have partnered with the private sector in order to uh, move towards uh, smart cities. While there have been positive gains, uh, there's also been some criticisms that uh, implementation mechanisms are not necessarily in place to implement policies. And uh, that often there is a lack of a sense of leadership understanding that pervades all level of the organization in order to drive the move towards a more coherent strategy and implementation of that strategy. So uh, I made a specific quote that referred to a study done on the city of Cape Town, but this uh, shortcoming could apply to all of South Africa's metros as they struggle to articulate clear plans and uh, approaches and budgets for what could be quite an expensive long-term uh, exercise. Internationally, cities are looking at new technologies such as the internet of things where different physical objects have sensors, meters and software. And so they can on a real-time basis transmit and exchange data with other devices over the internet. Um, for example, on traffic movements, for instance, and even in our homes, um, you know, more and more smart TVs are being connected to the internet, um, uh, even smart fridges, uh, robot vacuum cleaners, etc. And so more and more, we're moving into a connected uh, society, which is generating data all the time from these sensors on where people are, how they're interacting, uh, which could be monitor monitored and inform decision making. Uh, as citizens interact both socially and in trade and, and commerce as they transact. And uh, these uh, data sets draw on various sources such as multimedia, photographs, pictures, videos, mobile phones, GPS, facial recognition, social media, etc. And while they uh, bring a lot of advantages in terms of planning and monitoring, I'm sure the committee is well aware of the risks regarding uh, individual privacy, digital exclusion, and what this might mean for the democratic uh, culture. In South Africa, no city 
has really ventured yet into Internet of Things or artificial intelligence applications yet. Um, but, you know, th these things are on the horizon. And as we cities move to this new domain, uh, it's becoming clear that new governance models are also necessary, not just new technology. And um, around the world, there is a move towards smart governance. In other words, the ability of um, municipalities to make better decisions through a combination of ICT-based tools and technology, as well as more collaborative governance for the purpose of achieving their developmental uh, mandates. Um, my colleague, Professor um, Alani mentioned the concept of a producer. Um, when I first saw it, I thought it was a spelling mistake. Um, but it's quite deliberate because it reflects the nature of the citizen as a producer and as a consumer of information and, and services. And uh, to move towards this new type of governance model assumes that there's capacity um, within municipalities and cities for having the platforms, the plans, the policies, the procedures, and the infrastructure, and to be able to coordinate not only internally, but also with a broader range of, of stakeholders in uh, collaborative decision-making. There have also been quite robust critiques of smart city trajectories. For example, that they are too technocentric, that they don't focus on citizens, uh, that they are geared mainly towards the affluent and that they promote digital inclusion, uh, that they are top-down led by the state and uh, technology vendors rather than grassroots uh, participation, and that they try to make the way municipalities are currently doing things, their current business models, more efficient rather than fundamentally changing the governance relationships to move towards better collaboration and partnership with citizens, with NPOs, and with um, uh, the informal and formal sectors in uh, producing. When we look at the Smart City Initiative, it has been largely driven from individual municipalities, individual cities, and we haven't really had a nationwide Smart City agenda so far. When we look at the Digital uh, Society South Africa e-strategy, it does mention uh, Smart Cities briefly, for example, the need for municipal and citizen connectivity, the need for more R&D and for uh, uh, low power wireless technologies to support the internet of things and 5G and the formation of smart communities. It doesn't really provided a lot of detail on how we go about doing these things in a way that is digitally inclusive. And when we look at the cities themselves, uh, there's often a lack of stable leadership and coordinating bodies or regulations for smart city implementation. So for instance, if you look at the IT role of cities, you won't find that in the constitutional schedules because this role really didn't exist in 1994. If we look at the rest of Africa, we see that our African counterparts on our continent are already moving into uh, smart cities. Um, for example, Konzo Techno City in Kenya, Eco Atlantic in Nigeria, Hope City in Ghana, and Vision City in Rwanda. And uh, if we cast our mind back to the president's 2019 State of the Nation address, he also sketched a vision of a South African smart city founded on technologies of the fourth industrial revolution with high-speed rail and the construction of skyscrapers, factories, and other infrastructure. And this uh, has drawn some critique. We, uh, critics have asked, you know, do we really need the construction of completely new smart cities that would mainly uh, be oriented towards elites, given that the or more urgent challenges relating to basic food, water security, poverty, unemployment, et cetera. And um, we've already experienced in 2014 an attempt by the city of Cape Town 
to um, enter into a partnership with a Chinese development co company to um, create a smart city. But unfortunately, this didn't uh, go anywhere. Um, and our research would encourage us to rather grow smart cities gradually rather than trying to establish um, cities uh, completely from scratch. And uh, there can be choices of design and technology that can speak to the needs of low income communities using very low cost engineering and frugal innovative design. And so our recommendations would be that there is, it's important to formulate a national smart city strategy to provide a foundation for pro poor smart cities, smart vi villages and other um, smart environments. A municipal governments should actively create smart city policy documents based on broad consultation, including residents and businesses with digital access and making special efforts to consult micro and informal businesses as well. And they should develop the capacity for smart, collaborative and inclusive governance to broader public access, build digital skills in communities, and try and implement some of the directives of the national uh, digital and uh, future skills uh, strategy. Uh, what's important is that instead of waiting for big plans, it's very important that we actually go and implement on a small scale, uh, get that experiential learning, and um, you know, then a scale up instead of trying to um, develop a very detailed master plans to the T. It's also important that municipalities and cities, especially intermediate cities, get support from national government and local government to work collaboratively in order to uh, utilize these, uh, these digital technologies. Um, my colleague, uh, Professor Ani, has mentioned how um, easy it is to reuse platforms, for instance. So there are definitely economies of scale. Uh, and what's important is that these technologies are not only aimed at supporting economic innovation, but also social innovation as well um, in the education sphere, public health sphere, um, et cetera. And um, technical support could include the sharing of applications for smart city solutions and data science support for the definition of data structures and the creation of data analytics dashboards. And if these are designed flexibly enough, they can be shared by multiple projects uh, and shared across cities and just customized and thereby greatly reducing costs. Another area that we can look at is open post-school education. Uh, when we look at the 2017 ICT Development Index, uh, we see that uh, out of 176 countries, South Africa ranked 92 in uh, 2017, uh, and it fell from 88th place in the previous year. And some of the reasons behind that low ranking is the disparities in ICT access and usage by income level, race, location. And, uh, you know, that just speaks to the digital exclusion and the lack of digital access that we talked about earlier. And it's not just one international index. You know, if we look at the 220 IMD World Digital Competitiveness Ranking Benchmark, which looked at 63 economies at how they uh, employed digital technologies and the readiness for digital transformation. Again, we see a trend of South Africa dropping from 48th place in 2019 to 60th place in 2020. And uh, particularly when it comes to talent and digital skills uh, are areas where our counterparts are um, overtaking us. So it's critical that we look at post-school uh, education. And if we look at the latest budget, we see sustained uh, financial allocations to post-school education. But we also need to look not only at funding, but also the delivery model. And it's become very clear that if we use the existing delivery model, we are unlikely 
to expand the sector in order to meet not only our existing backlogs in skills in our economy, but also the additional skills pipeline, which is required for an inclusive and competitive digital economy. And when we look at our policies, our policies are actually quite outdated. So the 2014 policy for the provision of distance education in South African universities in the context of integrated post-school system, which was published in 2014 by um, the Department of um, uh, Higher Education, which it was called at the time, it recognized that more and more there was distance learning uh, but that was kind of the old fashioned distance learning, which uh, didn't really use technology to uh, facilitate uh, real time interaction between teachers and, 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 and lecturers and students. And, uh, you know, when you look at the funding formula, which this uh, policy uh, then put in place, it drew a very hard dichotomy between contact, traditional face-to-face -face physical learning and distance learning, which was the UNISA type learning where students were off campus, they learned through books on their own time. In the meantime, uh, we found that, especially with the pandemic, we've now moved to blended learning where there is technologically enabled face-to-face -face contact and uh, real-time interaction between uh, students and um, uh, academic staff. And yet that blended learning is not yet uh, factored into the funding formulas. When we look at open education resources, um, it is mentioned, for example, in the 2017 call for comments on the open learning policy framework for South African post-school education and training, but there is still no overarching national digital content and infrastructure policy for open education resources in the sector. And since 2014, technologies have really uh, advanced by leaps and bounds. And uh, the pandemic has also forced us to use platforms like we're using now, Microsoft Teams and Zoom. And uh, as technology progresses, New technologies are on the horizon, including gamification, virtual and augmented reality, big data, learning analytics, smart education technology, 3D printing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so these technologies can be applied to um, the, the sector as well. And these technologies have not really been incorporated in the policies that we have. And when we look at the pandemic, uh, we see that the pandemic forced a migration to online uh, teaching and online technologies. And this really uh, exacerbated the digital divide because those institutions that were already engaged in online teaching were more able to move to that emergency teaching and learning uh, situation compared to under-resourced historically disadvantaged institutions, which had not ventured before the pandemic into blended learning and were still uh, focused on conventional face-to-face -face modalities of, of teaching. When we talk about open education resources, uh, we're talking about the digitized learning, teaching and research materials in any format or medium that are in the public domain or issued under an open license, permitting educators to reuse, repurpose, adapt and distribute to others at no cost. Uh, so these could include e-textbooks, YouTube videos, uh, software that enables teaching and learning and so, and so on. So open education is one low cost initiative that can uh, adopt frugal innovation in the this, this sector. And the state in its role as an enabler can really encourage the post-school system to advance in this direction. Uh, just a quick example of a German university digitalization platform. Um, a central a platform is established and different universities share the materials 
um, and upload it to the platform and other universities can then use it as they see fit. Um, you know, there are no copyright issues, there are no uh, uh, paywalls, et cetera. And so, you know, instead of different institutions solving the same problem multiple times, we can actually share um, some of the content that uh, we've basically developed. So um, coming back to the recommendations, uh, the Open Learning Policy Framework for South Africa uh, proposed in the 2017 call for comments should be formalized with immediate effect uh, and updated uh, in the light of the uh, new uh, technological advancement since uh, 2017, uh, especially the, 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 the pandemic induced uh, teaching modalities. The implementation plan contained in the call should be revised and should be should directly address the specific challenges of the digital divide that would mitigate against uh, inclusiveness and equity in online learning. Uh, the funding formula should be uh, revised to take into account blended learning options rather than just the dichotomy between distance learning and uh, traditional face-to-face -face learning. Universities and post-school institutions, student organizations, and broader civil society should exert pressures on government to desist from bailing out inefficient institutions and challenging, channeling investments to um, human capital and uh, digital skills building. Uh, national government should prioritize uh, funding for investment in software innovation, pedagogical advancement, digital skills of lecturers and students, and not just in investment in hardware. Uh, so I think it's very tempting when we look at the international experience to think that if we provide hardware, we will change the way teaching and learning takes place in the classroom. Uh, this is not so. We need to also make sure that there is um, skills building uh, for teachers, for learners, for their parents, uh, for the uh, instructional leadership of principals, et cetera, and uh, national government should also consider prioritizing investment in building a South African open learning platform where digital content from South African post-school institutions can be uploaded, accessible free of charge by any person, noting that such free content enhances rather than diminishes the attractiveness of institutions for formal studies. So, um, you know, if we make content available, it will attract students, it will not detract students from um, wanting to go to a particular institution. And this learning platform could also be linked to a job matching platform powered by machine learning, which would advise job seekers on what courses uh, online are available um, that they should take to increase their employability. So now we'll just hand over to my colleague, uh, Professor Ayad Al-Ani to just talk quickly on the um, sorry to, to Dr. Trudy Hartzenberg to just talk quickly on to um, the capabilities of the state and where it needs to be built. Over to you, Trudy. Thank you so much, Tanya. And you've alluded to some of the areas of digital skills development, but also the support infrastructure necessary to build those capabilities. Infrastructure, equipment, obviously very, very important, but not enough necessary but not sufficient in terms of building a capable digital state for the 21st century economy. Now this diagram, um, honorable members, really summarizes what has become absolutely an essential in terms of the foundational skill set that governments need in order to not only offer digitization, to improve governance, but also to take advantage of the platform opportunities and some of the innovation at sector specific level. Tanya's mentioned, for example, in the educational sector, but also our regional development strategies focusing on smart cities and what can be done to certainly enable and very importantly to take a look at the public policy objectives of inclusion and universal access 
So access to bandwidth, access to digital facilities becomes absolutely important for government in order to engage with the citizens citizenry. So I think that's part of the capability set that needs to, to be developed. I think if we take a look at the collection here, and, and the heading of this is, is rather noticeable. Some years ago, we used to talk about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics as the important new skill sets that we need for a fast advancing economy. And um, Professor Lucy Abrams and Mark Burke, Burke have coined a new phrase, and that's STEMI, S-T-E-A-M-I-E. -E, and that includes science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics, innovation, and entrepreneurship. And if we just have a quick look around this circle of foundational skills, we start on the top left-hand side, art, entrepreneurship and innovation. These are the kind of soft skills that really cut across the capability network and, and needs that we have across all government agencies. So it includes languages, arts, design, entrepreneurship, business management. It's equally important for government and for government officials to understand business management and entrepreneurship as it is obviously for those private sector um, stakeholders to, to have those skill sets. We have to understand creative manufacturing. And, and again, Tanya has alluded to Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, data science, additive manufacturing, and so on. These are the new currencies for a competitive manufacturing sector in the 21st century. And we're starting to see that manufacturing becomes more services and digital intensive. And if we are going to have effective policies, we all need as government officials to understand how these, these manufacturing processes actually work and what investors look for when they look at investment location decisions, because that is how we would be able to diversify and develop the depth of our productive capacity, not only in manufacturing, it's equally important when we look at agriculture and also at the services sectors. Digital humanities, <clears throat> excuse me, data science analytics and artificial intelligence, these are really, again, a number of cross-cutting areas where mathematics used to be mathematics engineering when we took a look at, at STEM, but we're now looking at additive computation using big data for policy decisions becomes increasingly valuable to understand the information that we get from engaging with citizens in, in our economies and specifically in particular sectors, education, healthcare, and other social services sectors. If we take a look at Internet of Things, cloud and network engineering, this really now becomes an area that is growing in such leaps and bounds computer science, information, business systems, electronics, um, systems engineering, advanced communications engineering, and so on, network engineering, understanding our network services sectors, which really underpin much of our digital economy development. So if we take a look at the communication sector, it really is a network infrastructure services sector but the nature of that infrastructure has changed dramatically. Many of us no longer have fixed line telephones at home. So we work along a new collection of technologies, instruments, equipment, opportunities, and communication opportunities. But with those come extremely important opportunities for sector development. And I do want to underscore the policy objectives that, that Tanya has, has mentioned. Universal access, inclusion, when it comes to financial services, if you are not financially included, you are by implication excluded from many economic opportunities such as access to finance. So very important that we look at the interconnections within the skill sets and how they connect to economic opportunities across the economy. 
the engineering cluster, so to speak, material science, additive engineering. We're also taking a look at important new areas of, of skills development, mechanical engineering linked to robotics, for example, industrial engineering, design, chemical engineering linking to bio, biotech, um, and a range of, of other areas that become increasingly important. So the data skills and the digital skills set that we have to acquire as agents of governance and government become now much more demanding and diverse. And this is where, as Tanya has mentioned, we've had a number of policy initiatives and, and some of them have been implemented to some extent, but a great deal needs to be done in a concerted manner to keep updating those policies as technology and market developments and the demands of consumers, of producers, of traders, of you and I as citizens are changing all the time. So understanding, and this is another area of capabilities that, that is particularly important to develop, is to understand the regulatory requirements for a digital economy, understanding the regulatory environment and new approaches to regulation. And here we can look, for example, to some African countries. If we look at the financial services sector, just as one example, then Kenya, which is the home, as we know, to M-Pesa, mobile money, which has become so important, not only in Kenya, but across the East African region and, and also moving across to West Africa. They've adopted a model of adaptive regulatory reform and development. There are also sandboxes where um, some developed countries, the United Kingdom is a good example, have used sandboxes also for financial regulation, where they take a look um, at a small group of, of, of participants. These could be banks, fintech companies that participate in experiments with new regulation to see how that would work before that is actually adopted. So the skills to take a look at the regulatory models, which can be used in different sectors, keep in mind that the different sectors may have very, very different requirements. The basic governance requirements would, would be cross-cutting across the economy, but sector-specific regulation becomes particularly important. There's also, as we've mentioned before, the broader requirements in terms of data governance, consumer protection, privacy, protection of personal information that again cut across. Those areas of governance link to areas such as competition policy and law, but also consumer protection. We have the protection of personal information act that came into full force mid-year last year. It's a very, very powerful instrument for 21st century digital governance development. I think I'm going to stop there, Tanya, in the interest of time. Okay, over to you, uh, Ayad, uh, to share some final thoughts on change management. Yes, thank you very much. So to, to wrap this up, um, I, I think, uh, or put another way, we had some discussions um, uh, amongst us and uh, uh, on, on how to implement that. And uh, I, I guess I don't want you to be too, too humbled uh, uh, in front of those challenges uh, because I think there's also a unique way of implementing those kind of platforms and those kind of policies. Uh, so first of all, um, as we mentioned before, you don't have to re rebuild or, re or you don't have to build everything from scratch. So if you build, for instance, a platform once, I'm, I'm almost sure that you can reuse 50 to 60 to 70 percent of the of the platform in another context. So, for instance, if you uh, build uh, the, the platform that I mentioned before for, for the public broadcaster, there are some algorithms, there is some data and there is some content which you can reuse in another context, for instance, in the area of smart cities, or you can reuse them in the area of trading platforms, for instance, also very important. You can use them in the area of smart agriculture. So there is this idea to build a platform and then use this platform as a, as a blueprint in other sections. 
uh, and that is greatly reducing the lead time for the construction also of course reducing the costs and uh, minimizing the, the the skills required so this is a so-called change by platform approach uh, finally on the on the last slide um, we we have to look at what should South Africa do now in front of those challenges. And uh, uh, I guess from the from the outside, my recommendation would be that South Africa should be thinking of building its own platforms. Why is that so? Taking, for instance, the example of the of, of a trading platform. Uh, so China, for instance, has used its trading platform Alibaba to encourage um, uh, development and trade in poor rural areas. So for instance, the Alibaba team went to villages in China and tried to figure out, you know, is there, are they producing anything that we can resell on the world market? And then they made an agreement on that. But in order to do something like that, you have to own the platform or you have to at least influence it. If you don't own a platform, you risk becoming a supplier, a supplier of services. Uh, and you then you also cannot even use the, the data that is being uh, analyzed by the platform. So that puts you an additional risk. And if you look at the chart on the left side, then it's very clear that uh, uh, America USA and, and Asia, mainly China, are really in front and uh, are building platforms that cover all aspects of life. Uh, Europe, for, for many reasons, is lacking behind. Uh, and so is Africa, of course. And um, therefore, my, my encouragement would be to, to really consider building platforms uh, for the national use, but also uh, you can start thinking about the regional cooperations, but because you can reuse those platforms also in, in other countries. Uh, and uh, on the on the right side, you see an interesting uh, remark here by the uh, Swiss Foreign Ministry, which has included digitization and digital strategy in the soft diplomacy approach of Switzerland. So they are trying to move away from, from banking and private banking, but also trying to introduce Switzerland as a country that is leading in digitization. And uh, I think this is also something that South Africa could consider uh, making digitization efforts, digitization cases, digitization ambitions and policy part of a uh, foreign diplomacy approach that encourages cooperation with with other countries and uh, which are in the in the region or are in a similar situation. Or one could even look at the at the BRICS scenario in this context. So, by having said that, um, I want to thank you for your for your patience uh, for the long time of listening, and I give over to Tanya for some concluding remarks. Thank you very much. And so, um, just to sum up some of the key messages and. The key message is that for the state, the capacity is not just adopting technology, but also changing the way it actually delivers according to these new roles. And uh, to rise to the challenge, it requires a commitment by the state to actively engage, learn, collaborate, plan, partner, innovate. And uh, this requires new behaviors, both from the part of the state as well as non-state actors like citizens, NGOs, uh, private sector, etc. And uh, the bottom line is with if the state does nothing, the economy will become digitally enabled anyway, irrespective of the contributions by the state. But if the state intervenes um, in uh, an enabling framework that promotes inclusivity, um, you know, it can at the margin help steer digital development uh, in a way that aligns with um, you know, our constitutional priorities and the vision of each South African citizen participating fully in the digital economy and society. So we've just shared some of the main highlights of the paper. You can find the full paper at the URL below if it hasn't been distributed to you already. And so with that, I'm going to uh, hand over uh, to the chair and uh, stop sharing my uh, presentation. Over to you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Prof. Fatou and the team. 
Uh, honorable members, um, I think you've been listening to the presentation like I did. And at this point, I would uh, invite those who would want to uh, make their contributions uh, either through questions, clarities, comments, uh, and so on. Ajira, you'll also then assist me uh, in case I, I do not uh, see the hands on my side. I'll do that, Jay. Yes, and of course, I'm also looking at uh, the time for those that uh, may be going to the other meetings. <laughs> right, so if I can get uh, those who would want to comment. Otherwise, I do know that uh, one of the things will be that the presentation will surely be shared uh, for referral post. Uh, this is, uh, Ms. Bodlani, Chairperson, and Mr. Malachi. Okay. Honorable Bodlani, Honorable Malachi, in that order. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Chairperson, uh, we thank the Vesling for the presentation. Uh, I, perhaps mine is more a comment than it is questions and the panel can tell us if they want to expand on my, my, my opinions. I think what we have seen in, in, in South Africa and that has come across from this presentation is that the policies that we have are not necessarily bad. We really suffer at the implementation phase. And my feeling is that also our policy processes are more reactive and we, 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 we respond to problems. We, we do not preempt the future. I think in our planning as a country, we are not futuristic at all. And if we are going to move along as swiftly as the rest of the world has moved for us to really be part of the globalization and the, in the fourth industrial revolution, we really need to, 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 to change our relationship to policy. And one of the things that I think we, we really do miss in the policy formulation as a, as, as a formu policy formulation process is the public participation. Hence, you end up with poor buy-in or lack of buy-in from the citizens because then you have a top-down communication in terms of what the new policy is. And that is something that is at the feet of the officials and us as politicians, we really do let that slide where we, we do not encourage public participation so that to hear the views of the citizen so that the policy can be a living organism. So what we do, unfortunately, how we relate to policy is problematic and it's going to be problematic if we are going to achieve what countries that were presented to us have achieved. And you, you know, every time you talk about digital, digitalization and you, 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 you almost, even myself, as aware as I am, you almost hear digital, digital, <laughs> digitalization as an enemy of jobs. And I do appreciate from the presentation that it does not necessarily have to be. And again, maybe again to the point I was making to say, if we are ever going to be ready to compete with the world, we must be deliberate about making sure that children move along with the technological uh, experiences of, of, of the current day and age so that you do not have a child interacting with a computer for the first time when they are doing their application for university. But again, it's, it's a global recognition of all the challenges that we face that before we even get to a point where children are then able to interact with the technology, you have children that are still studying in math classes. So I think it's, it's, it, you can't look at anything. You, you, you cannot look at this presentation in isolation and not consider the things that the state of the country that that the, 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 there's a lot of hindrances to us really moving along with our peers and granted we are slightly ahead in terms of what our peers are able to achieve and on the issue of open learning policy again it's really the, the, there's gaps it, it's going to I'm tempted to, and not at the risk of sounding like a pessimist, that it might take us a lifetime to, at the pace that we are moving, to really be able to 
move in the same circles as our as as our global peers and we saw i think what one of the things that covid pronounced greatly on was the inequality and the 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 never mind the water and and, and sanitation facilities when it comes to learning tools I, I mean for a child to be able to have textbooks and access to their teacher is a tool of the trade and covid exposed those sort of things and it, it's it's all those things that sh- consideration should be made in terms of how we are going to move forward if we as a country are going to really achieve this smart city that all of us want to live in. Uh, the, the, the last slide talks about sectional interest of capture. Uh, I did not get that and would appreciate the panel elaborating on that. The, the dangers thereof, if at, at all, that, 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 that's it from me, Chairperson. Thank you for the presentation and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Bola. Honorable Malachi. Thanks, Chair. With your permission, I'm going to ask just to be on audio without my video on. Um, from the onset, I think one insightful presentation is just laying the landscape in terms of, you know, what the current status quo is with regards to the digital era we are in and what the forecasts are. But the one thing that I wanted to source from, from the panelists is, you know, given where we are as a country and what we aspire to in terms of, you know, being one of the leading countries in the digital economy, are we making the right um, investments in our digital infrastructure, um, you know, in, in state in state facilities and even in communities so that we do not, excuse me, as my colleague indicated, um, entrench the inequality that is currently um, existing in South Africa, but that we use the digital era we are in um, to close that gap because, you know, any forecast of the future shows that, you um, digitization is going to be a key dictator of economic life, a key dictator of normal life um, in, in any event. And also to juxtapose that with, um, given, given the legislative framework that South Africa is in, particularly with the regulation of information, access of information and the flow of information, you know, what, what are some of the interventions that South Africa can can be working towards to ensure that as we move towards being, you know, a legit, a leading digital um, country, we do not suffocate one the consumption and expression and freedom of expression through the regulatory framework that is increasingly driven by the state. Thank you. Dira, any other member I may be leaving out? Okay, I can then uh, hand over to the team uh, to respond to some of the points raised and then probably come as last. I was thinking, uh, Ayad, do you want to uh, go first and then Trudy and then I will comment later? Um, I, I, I cannot talk about this state capture thing as not being a South African. Maybe there are more relevant perspectives than mine. Um, what about the, the dangers of digitization? I think this is a very relevant question. And one is, of course, uh, as you have seen in all the examples, we use lots of data. And uh, of course, uh, this is then... Uh, a sweet sour experience, so to say. So you have to protect the data and make sure that nobody else uses it uh, because you are going to generate lots of data the, the more you use platforms. So you, you need then a very strong kind of security mechanism. You need to figure out what data can be used by whom. And um, there are two ways of doing that. One is the European way. Europe has been very strict from the beginning. Uh, uh, they could have been sick because they didn't develop most of the platforms, uh, whereas other countries like China, for instance, did not have much regulation and they allowed for lots of freedom. So you, you had 
uh, lots of innovative platforms uh, moving also into the international sphere. And only lately, the Chinese regulators have stepped in. So I would assume then if you if you are trying to catch up, uh, you will have not a strict regulation uh, as you would have in other countries, but then you have to catch up very, very quickly uh, on the on the development. Um, so this is this is uh, this is one thing. The, the second, I think, important question which you which you mentioned was, uh, what about inequality? And I think um, I think it's important to understand that digitization is not about equality. Uh, it will be it will be a matter. It will be a project for experts. So, for instance, as uh, Trudy Herzenberg mentioned, you need data scientists in South Africa, but you will not have ten thousands. But you maybe you will have 100, 200, 300. So, what I'm trying to say is, you have you have experts, uh, not in a great number, but in a small number. So, you need to use the experts in light tower projects. Uh, but then you could use them in projects again, which could empower equality so, so it's a it's a it's a it's a double thing it's a it, it, it will be an, an expert-led project at the beginning but you should invest the experts in projects that uh, disseminate lots of equality for instance in the area of uh, smart cities or, or or education where you have very very quick uh, uh, egalitarian effects uh, the, the the philosophy of digitization is again is, is however is not equality it's uh, it's it's more a meritocratic kind of thing meritocracy means that you are awarded uh, according to your results and output so but if you don't deliver any output then you are not considered in the system so this is how digitization digitization platforms usually work uh, but then again, you need to, you can direct them to work uh, against those mechanisms. Um, so, uh, Tanya, maybe you would like to say something about state capture? Um, yeah, I'll come to that. Um, but Trudy, do you have any comments to make from your perspective? Thanks very much, Tanya. And I think those are really important comments and, and questions a little bit about the infrastructure. I think it's so important to keep in mind that a legitimate public policy objective is universal access to digital infrastructure and the associated services. And I think that's so important. And this public policy objective needs to be a cross-cutting one. So for example, when we take a look at performance requirements for investors coming into some of the key sectors, then it is quite acceptable to build in development requirements, which would help us to achieve those universal access um, policy objectives. I think that's so important to keep in mind. The other issue is that the state is not alone. And I think that's so, so important. Partnerships with other stakeholders Tanya, I think, referred to community-based organizations to the private sector. This really has to be about partnerships. The state has a particular role to play because it is the state. It is responsible for regulation. But the issues around regulatory capture and so on, we see internationally important cases, disputes being being um, in process as far as these issues are concerned. So the state has a particular role, but when it comes to building of infrastructure, building capabilities, addressing the skills deficits, it really can leverage very, very smart partnerships with academia, with civil society, the NGO community, with ordinary citizens like you and I to achieve those objectives. And I think this is where open access platforms become so, so important. As Tanya mentioned, in the case of education, putting out resources and material does not undermine or diminish your intellectual capabilities and your prowess in terms of, of education service delivery, but it has a multiplier effect. And I think that's what we want in terms of achieving inclusive, equal access across economy and society. Thanks, Tanya. 
Okay, so um, I want to touch on the issue, um, expand on the issue of um, vested interests, which uh, Trudy touched on the issue of regulatory capture. Um, I wasn't really only referring to vested interests in the state, but also vested interests from tech vendors, for example, at a municipal level. Are we choosing appropriate technologies for digital inclusion, or are we, um, you know, buying into um, the incentives of high-end tech vendors to sell their wares, for instance. Um, I'll just give you one example. If you look at um, mobile phones, South Africa tends to import high-end devices, which are actually quite expensive, right? Um, whereas if you look at India, you look at China, you know, there's a lot more um, middle-of-the-road devices with things like dual SIM for small businesses to ensure um, you know, better conductivity, even with prepaid. Um, so our entire market is actually biased towards the top end, you know, rather than to the middle and, and, and lower end. And um, so, you know, when you look at the tech industry, there are lots of uh, vested interests which don't necessarily cater for, um, you know, the poor, for instance. We've also seen a lot of competition policy uh, regulation um, on data pricing, for instance, that try to address some of those uh, vested interests. Um, Honorable Podlani raised a cluster of very important issues. I have to agree with her that if you look at our plans, our plans are actually, um, you know, very comprehensive. Uh, but unfortunately, we've had uh, problems with the capacity to actually deliver. And that was one of the reasons why we focused our presentation on the capability of the state, because the digital transformation will be led by the private sector. You know, unlike water infrastructure, unlike electricity infrastructure, most of the digital infrastructure is actually owned by the private sector, right? Um, but the state can play an important role in shaping the trajectory to make sure that that trajectory is um, more equitable and um, more inclusive. And so it's important to focus on uh, how we do that implementation and not just think that we can acquire new technology and then we can continue with business as, as, as usual, right? Um, I also agree with her that our policy has tended to be rather reactive um, rather than proactive. And that's because we've been through a decade of turbulence, where our focus has been inward rather than external. Uh, but I think that, you know, if you look at world geopolitics, you know, with the war in Europe, et cetera, et cetera, suddenly South Africa is starting to look good. You know, our land is improving, right? And um, well, what I feel is that even in the midst of crisis, there are opportunities that we can um, seize. Uh, I think we just need to be very clear to get all role players on board um, and to really focus on, uh, you know, the excluded rather than, you know, the more affluent who can use market forces, you know, to, to make sure that it meets their, their preferences. Um, the issue of jobs and job losses during to, uh, during to, to, uh, to for, fourth industrial revolution is an interesting one because, Studies have shown that we could actually grow our jobs as a result of the fourth industrial revolution, right? Um, the main problem is that the jobs will become more skills intensive, right? Uh, especially if we leave it to the private sector. So we can't just focus on high tech and startups. We also need to look at the traditional sector. For example, agriculture. You know, there's a lot of opportunities for us in um, precision agriculture, um, looking at uh, how we can use more sustainable water and energy uh, in agriculture. Because you know, if you look at uh, China and India becoming rich, uh, there are demands for our products, agricultural products, they sustain longer term demands, right? Um, so you know, we need to make sure that uh, you know, we kind of manage that transition so that uh, we don't have the tech sector moving forward by leaps and bounds, but our traditional sector lagging behind, um, especially traditional sectors that can absorb a, a, a lot of, um, you know, um, more mid-level um, uh, 
um, labor where we can do reskilling and upskilling uh, to ensure that we um, prepare people for the transition uh, which, is, which is coming. I uh, also want to agree fully on the issue of public participation. I think that we must realize that Zoom conversations like this um, works for a certain demographic, uh, but Parliament will actually always have to do field trips, go to rural areas, have discussions with, um, with, with, with communities face to face, and also be open to social media, um, because social media has become the new form of expression where people can express themselves in their own mother tongue. And uh, I think that, you know, while you might look at uh, states trying to uh, have uh, repression and limit freedom of expression, it's very difficult to do with the internet. In fact, it's almost impossible, right? Um, uh, these days, uh, you know, the South African government couldn't really stop the internet from, um, from communicating. I mean, China is trying their best to do that, but they actually are not succeeding. I think that the issue would be more around fake news, knowing which news is actually credible and you know what is actually just propaganda when you have so many unconfirmed sources uh, that are deluging people. And then finally, uh, Honorable Malazzi um, made a uh, some observations and also asked a question, which is, you know, are we making the right investments in uh, infrastructure? Um, I think that one of the big issues there is that, you know, if you want to put in this infrastructure, you know, there's such a long regulatory process that needs to be followed at different spheres of government that it actually discourages um, the, 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 the private sector. And, um, you know, while there were license conditions uh, to these uh, um, mobile service providers that they needed to provide free access to schools, etc. We haven't really enforced those conditions. And I really hope with the new round of spectrum allocation, we will actually enforce those conditions for um, opening up uh, access. And then, as I said before, you know, when we look at the role of municipalities, for instance, in the digital space, uh, and you look at the schedules of the constitution in 1994, there isn't really an explicit role or mandate for municipalities or cities to play in that space. And so I think that because this is a new role, which is driven by new technologies, we need to formalize that because the private sector um, will be quite happy to extend to cities where uh, there's high densities and it's profitable. Um, but they are very unlikely to want to extend to rural areas where densities are low and costs of uh, rollout are much more expensive. Um, so with that, uh, I'll just hand back over to you, Chair. Thank you. Um, may I just check if there may be other members that would want to speak? Uh, if not, I'll, I'll take it that uh, they'll also have an opportunity to look at the presentation once again, but also access uh, the full paper um, and, and that there can still be further engagements. But I, I just thought I, I should make the following, um, having listened to the presentation as well as the responses, that uh, I think there's also the reality that in making the law at any given time, it's informed by material conditions at the time. And what technology is putting forward now is that our laws would also have to be preemptive, uh, that you would not need to update all the time, uh, but looking at the trends, be able to project what the future is like, probably in between intervening periods, uh, maybe consider some status quo reports, uh, like what uh, others would do, uh, like in Japan would have a white paper produced uh, uh, almost annually to give uh, the state of affairs in South Africa, it may probably be looking at uh, 
uh, the intervals you have midterm, you have an election on local government uh, at the end of the five year period. Uh, it's an election of uh, national government, which in a way, when you have local government, it's midterm review of uh, decisions taken by uh, government for that term, informed by different uh, manifestos. And at the end of the five years, you can then make an assessment whether there's been impact uh, made by such policies uh, and see if there's a need to review legislation. Now I'm raising this because of the time it takes to put a bill together and ultimately become an act. And that from a point of innovation, uh, unfortunately things move very fast uh, compared uh, to that. As a result, you may, for example, adopt a particular technology and see it to be working and it's, it's obsolete in no time. Uh, hence the country's approach has been a technology uh, neutral in approach. Um, but as I say, maybe it's something about predictive uh, legislation uh, that may not need uh, amendment every time there is uh, something new in the space because that's not possible. Uh, maybe the other thing to really consider on the integration, I like the integration, even though the emphasis on the presentation has been about the role uh, in the continent as well as uh, internationally. But I'm just saying even internally, uh, there's been complaints about uh, the bureaucratic red tape in making business uh, of government to function. Uh, that it would be good indeed to, if, if you are coming into the space, and, and, and I thought you'll probably make an example about a country in the continent where such would, would be found to be happening so that uh, it's understood that South Africa can be able to do that. Where you have really an integration of your state of environment report, you have a sense of your environmental management framework applying in this particular area, the state of uh, water resources and so on. So that when you make an application, for example, for mining rights, at least all those could be done uh, in that single window uh, you talk about. And that uh, I would know in few minutes or a uh, few hours whether that application would, would see the light of day uh, or not, uh, looking at what uh, <clears throat> what is available as as information, uh, but but again, uh, I also saw the emphasis more on the the economic side, uh, trying to revive the economy and so on. <clears throat> but the reality is that for any thriving economy, you are likely to have uh, two major uh, obstacles that firstly you can attract uh, corrupt elements in the system, they, they collapse the system to benefit uh, themselves. But <clears throat> we are also living in a situation where if uh, the economy is doing well, you can also attract terrorists coming your way. And, and I've looked at the example you've given of China on the entities that are brought in, uh, that the public safety element is also in there and I didn't get that emphasis because others may come in as business people, get through your system, but necessarily uh, these may be actually the hubs to find wars elsewhere in the world, uh, but using South Africa as a breeding ground for that. Uh, so, so I'm just saying that integration to me uh, should also be about, about that. Uh, uh, so, so that the benefits of advanced technology should also not bring the other element to it, where, whether cyber or whatever, you have uh, unnecessary attacks that you didn't have uh, before looking at your, your traditional uh, systems and so on. Uh, right. <clears throat> Maybe the last point would really be some lessons, I think, Honorable Bodani talked about the inequality aspect of what COVID would have uh, revealed. But I think from a positive side though, is that in densely populated areas, uh, 
we would not have your physical police and so on getting in into such spaces, but drones were able to still pass a message there and probably thinking again from crime prevention strategies on how to police such areas, which is difficult to get your physical and only be coming in as a, a response or backup uh, system, but from a point of just monitoring and technology plays uh, that important uh, role. So, so I'm just saying <clears throat> that has come out uh, very nicely in the during the COVID uh, side where people need to do social distancing and they will hear a mayor in a rural province speaking as though he's walking on the streets, but necessarily it's not, but just the drones that are, are deployed in the space. Uh, so, so I just thought I should make those, otherwise uh, the presentation uh, would have been uh, very good. I think it's uh, eye-opening, especially from those of us who also have the responsibility of ensuring that we make enabling legislation um, for, 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 for the development of the country, uh, but also that we're playing oversight on important uh, state-owned uh, uh, companies um, like CETA that is supposed to also play a role in the space of uh, digital, including the innovative part of it. I've seen some of the platforms that have been put by CETA uh, that probably we as a country needs to build confidence in using those um, uh, platforms that are created by, by people in the country. Uh, I've, I've looked at one platform similar to the one we're using now to, to engage, but would, would opt to have this one compared to what we ourselves put together. I think we still need to build confidence because uh, we, we may unconsciously uh, also make people to believe that we are not yet there, but it may be because in some instances, we ourselves are not confident enough to use that that we produce uh, ourselves. So I just thought I should make those uh, uh, comments. I'm not sure if you'd wanted to respond to that. Uh, before we we close uh, the session. And no, uh, thank you. I think we covered. Okay. So in that score, uh, with that, I would uh, really thank members as well as uh, your team for, for coming through. We had agreed as the committee that in every uh, term of the committee, uh, what you'd call the quota, that we create space uh, for discussions of this nature. Uh, in some instances, we have organized them as roundtable discussions to also get other stakeholders to participate and get different perspectives on, on the same subject matter, uh, so as to learn more from what people uh, think and advise us to do. And that's what we would want to continue to do uh, going forward as part of uh, building capabilities of uh, uh, the team we have. We do have new members, of course, uh, because this depends purely on political parties. Uh, they will allocate and reallocate members. Um, so we would want to continue, as I say, in that way, so as to also close that gap uh, that as we have new members that come in, at least they also have uh, the grounding, uh, especially from the side of uh, the academia, where you can uh, also speak about other matters freely because they are not about decision making, but uh, allowing us to take informed decisions. We really appreciate that. Uh, thank you. Uh, until uh, we meet again, members, uh, unless Sajira, unless there is any other matter I would have left out now. Otherwise, uh, thanks to the team. Uh, no, really I, no other matter, Chair. No other matter, thank you. So we really appreciate that. Uh, this uh, takes us to indeed uh, the close of uh, the meeting. And I do see that at least there are positive comments even from other participants who are not members that it was an informative uh, session and, and very pleased to 
have attended it. Uh, I see Mr. Dimitri is putting that. Uh, thank you. This meeting then uh, uh, is adjourned uh, officially. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Chair and members. Thanks, Tanya and Ayad. Thank you. Bye.